pig pigs of youngsters. That would explain the very excited behavior between them. Wonderful, right? Well, it's not just the warthogs and myself and Manu that are joining you this afternoon. Jamie and Craig are in the other car and they are heading up to the marsh. Let's go see how far Jamie is. I didn't get very far at all. And strangely enough, what has attracted the attention of the lions was in fact a warthog as well. So it's not just Taylor, the warthogs and myself out here, but we've got the Angama Pride as well. A very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Jamie, and this afternoon Craig is on camera with me, and we're sitting right below the escarpment with the Angama Pride. So the four females and their 13 cubs. At least I assume there's 13 cubs here. It's a little bit tricky to tell, but it's lovely to have you all on board with us, and don't forget, because you're on a live safari here from the Masai Mara, and of course in the Sabi Sand in South Africa. You can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And we've actually got a really lovely scene in front of us. Of course, our lioness and her cubs posing beautifully on a termite mound. Oh, you almost gave us a beautiful yawn there, little one. And then, if we have a look across to the right, we've also got a, a journey of giraffe, which is quite lovely as well. There you go. They've obviously spotted the lions from their vantage point and they've been keeping a close eye on them. A very typical standard anti-predator behavior to stare in the direction of something like a lion or a leopard. So those giraffes are staring, I assume, at the other lionesses, which must be a little bit just past where we can see. Now the lovely thing about this particular pride of lions, of course, is the fact that we always pretty much always know where they are, which is really very helpful. They're always around this river system, and barring the few times that they've been into the thick forest at the base of the mountain, we've pretty much, if we want to, we can always find them. We can't always get to them. Sometimes they're, uh, they're sort of out of reach. But this is one of their favorite gardenia trees. And we often see them hanging out around here. Now, I know that Taylor, was it, was it the Angamas that Taylor was with last night? I think it must have been. I know she was watching them hunt. Sinak, it is lovely to hear from you. Now, Sinak, I think perhaps you are, I don't know if you're a new viewer or not. I know I haven't asked, answered a question from you yet. Um, Sinak, the males, well, they're around. So essentially, the males, sorry. I'm distracted by a bird flying. I think it was just a vehicle that scared it. Um, essentially, males are not part of the pride. They have a territory that encompasses the territories of several different prides. So they kind of move between ladies and at the same time move off on their own to patrol the territorial boundaries, to roar and make sure that no other male lions think that it would be a good idea to come and disturb this particular patch of theirs. So I'm not sure where the males are today. I would say that they are, they generally spend time either here with the Angamas or close to the Angamas, or else, generally speaking, they're a bit further to the south of us, to the southeast of us, at the marsh, or at least the dominant males that we see here. And I spent the last two nights in Musiara Marsh, desperately searching for male lions, and we didn't succeed, but we did have a really stunning evening with the Ridge Pride. I hope that this evening promises to provide those opportunities as well. So while we sit here and enjoy the company of the Angamas, let's go, because of course we're not just here in the Mara, let's go across to South Africa to enjoy some sights there. Good afternoon, fellow safarians, and welcome to our Sunset Safari from South Africa. My name is Tristan, and on camera today I do have Senzo, and today is a quite a special day in South Africa. It is Heritage Day in South Africa, so we are going to be celebrating all things South African. If you want to know a little bit about South Africa, you can use hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or on YouTube chat, and maybe we'll address some of the South African questions and theme it in a South African way. Now, I forgot I wanted to do a face painting, and I wanted to ask Senzo to wear South African socks, but we both forgot because we were rushing around a bit to get on to drive. I know, we were a little bit late. Naughty us. Right. Right. 
Now, the reason why I'm down here is because I have a report that there is a spotted cat somewhere in where I am now. So I'm just going to have a look. I don't know whether or not it's on the Juma side, whether it was on Little Gauri, but there was a report by somebody that they saw one here. Um, whether or not it was actually visible for us is anyone's guess, but we're going to try and have a little look and check and see. Maybe we get lucky with it and we find something here. Now, you might also notice that there is an odd shaped two eyes kind of peering from my steering wheel. Yes, that is Puji. Puji is back and visible. I couldn't find anywhere to put Puji over the last little bit because Rusty doesn't have the best places for Puji. So I was thinking, well, let me try and find somewhere that it will work. And so Puji is now on a roller coaster ride on the steering wheel. He's probably going to be thoroughly ill by the end of all of this, but that's where we've decided to put Puji and hopefully Puji will have some fun where he is now. Now this is apparently where this leopard was seen, but but I don't see anything myself. Of course that might not be the case that it might just be sitting somewhere here and I haven't seen it so I'm going to do a little bit to the west of the driveway just to check if it's not on one of the termite mounds here or sitting somewhere in this general vicinity of course it also could have gone south there's some kudu right there so that means that there's probably in all likelihood not a leopard anywhere here the kudu are a bit obscured to the south so I want to just go forward a bit. There are impalas to my north as well. So if there is a leopard, it's sandwiched between quite a lot of prey animals. And it would be nice if I can find some sort of sign of it to give me a better idea of where it's actually gone and which leopard this actually is. Here we go. Here's the tracks right here. So this leopard has gone somewhere in this general vicinity and its tracks go up and then turn to the right. Now Senzo, if you look on this top of this mound here, You'll see, I'm going to try and direct you, but if you look, where's that stick? Okay, from this stick here, just go a little bit up and to your right, there it is right there. So there you can see the little footprint for a leopard going over. It looks like a small female, so I think this could be Shadow's Cubs track, and maybe Shadow's track is also somewhere around here. So there is the track for this leopard crossing north into Juma. Now it's just a matter of us actually finding it and trying to see where it's gone. I wonder if Treehouse Dam is not a good place to go and check. If we haven't seen anything just yet we'll try and check around Treehouse Dam but there is definitely that is the tracks we're looking for and the good news is that they're going north into Vuyatela and not out which is fantastic so I'm gonna try and follow these track for track and just see where they go maybe this is a leopard is lying right here and I've just missed it Mm -mm -mm. I've just got to turn my car to get close. I think this is who it's got to be for. I mean, obviously it could also be Shongila given the size of it, which would be absolutely phenomenal if it's her, because as we've been saying, we're really desperate to try and see where she is and what's going on with her. It looks like that's where it was lying down. I'm just trying to see the track from here, which way it goes. Senzo, can you see anything? I don't see any leopard here. There's some fallen over branches that I just want to check as well. You see the kudu and the impalas look fairly relaxed. They're not in any way barking or making a noise and they're just in front of me here. So I don't think there's a leopard lurking that side. The kudus have come from the south and are moving slowly northwards. So I think if anywhere this leopard must be on our northern side here somewhere and maybe just maybe just sitting in a little thicket watching what's going on. So I'll try and just check around. If I don't find tracks here I'm going to go to Treehouse Dam because I think maybe just maybe Treehouse Dam is the place where we're going to find this leopard. It might have been going for water. It has warmed up considerably in comparison to this morning's drive. This morning it, the wind was very cold but that wind has settled and it's a much warmer feel this afternoon and so maybe that's pushing this leopard to go and have a drink of water. Okay, um, where else can I check? Just having a look here. I didn't see any tracks on this road. Maybe the fire break is worth having a little look as well. Now I do apologize that my head is out the car most of the time. Jay, you're asking why am I driving an open vehicle? Well, Jay, it's quite simple. It's The open vehicle just allows us to see a lot more of what's going on. So from this open vehicle, I can be able to spot things in the trees. I can see birds flying over and it allows the cameraman to be able to focus on all of those kind of things. We don't have any obscurities to deal with, so we don't have to worry about... Um, 
you know branches or roofs or windows or anything like that we can be completely open and allows us then to explore our environment in a really good way and allows us to show all of you what's going on sorry I just heard a bit of a noise right next to me so I thought maybe there was something moving next to me but it's just a Franklin now there's also an Impala up front which means that this leopard must be in between all of this either that or it's completely out of this area so I don't know but the open vehicle is just much better for viewing it really allows us to be able to interact with the environment that much better and be able to bring all of you much better visuals from the comfort of your home so roofs are, are also difficult because we off-road a lot so unlike in Kenya where the guys are off-roading through grassy areas or sticking to the roads we on the other hand have it very different here ours area as you can see is dense it's thick it's a lot harder for us to be able to off-road here and a roof would really complicate that and so we don't try and leave the roofs off as much as possible and only utilize them when we really have to so only when it rains do we put a roof on just to protect the equipment from the rain but otherwise it's roof off and enjoying the sunshine if there is sunshine or any sort of weather that we get and it, it's nice actually it feels as though you're part of an open system and that you can kind of just spread your arms and feel air in your face and I really thoroughly enjoy driving an open vehicle like we do now we also don't even have doors on top of it so that's another part of our vehicles that is a little bit different okay hyena tracks no leopard track here I wonder where are you leopards ah Maggie I'm so glad you asked how we celebrate Heritage Day because there's no better way to celebrate Heritage Day than to have a good old-fashioned braai and now a braai for us in South Africa is basically a barbecue in the rest of the world and what we'll do is we get as much nice meat as we can find and we throw it on the fire and we'll have some vegetables that we'll do on the fire basically corn on the cob there will also be salads and a bit of pup which is basically a white polenta it's maize meal that's ground down mixed with water and boiled and it makes this kind of hardened pup thick almost, I don't know what the texture is, polenta-ish. And then we make a sauce with it called shiba, which is a tomato and onion sauce that goes with the pup. And then you have basically nyama, which is meat and pup and shiba, and you eat that together and you get all your friends that you can, and you have the biggest braai possible. And then you get, well, some apple juices as well, because you can't have a braai without an apple juice at night. And that's how you do it. So that's how we will be celebrating this our evening after drive we're going to have ourselves a little barbecue all together with the crew that are here we've even invited some of the chefs and we've invited a couple other people and it should be quite festive well I think it will be festive and very fun so it's going to be an awesome morning or evening and that's the way we celebrate it if I was in Johannesburg with my friends there or if I was wherever that's how I would do it there as well so that's typically what happens and it's really is South Africans do love a good barbecue we love to be able to cook the really good quality meat that we get out here and well also we have any excuse just to have a bit of a social event and have a couple drinks together it really does go down a treat so that's normally what happens with Heritage Day and what will be happening on our Heritage Day here at Juma I wonder if the Kenyan guys are going to celebrate with us Ah, the Kenyan guys are also going to have a bright excellent well done team in Kenya it's just what we want to hear we were, I would have been thoroughly disappointed in Brent Leo Smith if there wasn't a braai because Brent Leo Smith loves a barbecue and loves to put a steak on the fire and I remember talking to him the other day and he was so excited to have a steak that I think even I got excited for him to eat his steak on the phone because he was telling me how he had got found this good quality steak in Nairobi when he was on leave and he was almost foaming at the mouth he was so excited about his meat so I'm sure he's going to have organized something delicious for everybody and hopefully it will be delicious and they'll all enjoy it we shall definitely have a toast for them Kylie you're asking if other than all the bribe food what other staple South African foods would we have that's about it we're really simple out here we have combined a lot of different cultures together and in the end of the day a heritage day food you might be able to throw in a couple things depending on what culture you're part of so you might do some Mapani worms although it's not a good time for those at the moment um, you might do if you're Afrikaans you might do some cook sisters which is basically a 
dough that is deep fried and then drenched in syrup which yes it is as good as it sounds and yes it has also caused thickening of the arteries as it sounds as well so that's what you would have if you know on the african side of things would have that um, it depends on your culture but you know generally it's more just about the barbecue and about friends and about having people together and and some people do you know take inspiration from their backgrounds as Italian or Spanish or Portuguese we get a, we have a big population of Portuguese and Italian in South Africa so it just depends on what your personal fancies are and, and most of the time the theme is meat on a fire and a couple of uh, drinks and friends that's pretty much how we celebrate any day let alone just Heritage Day Heritage Day just gives us an excuse to do it as big and as best as we can and Senzo is laughing behind the camera because he knows exactly what I'm talking about and I'm right am I not Senzo exactly Senzo is nodding in improvement he's saying yes that is exactly how it works and so we all pretty much that's how we theme it is it really doesn't matter what you have it's all just about the f company and spending time with friends and family now I haven't found any further sign of this leopard LM you're asking if a barbecue could ever include kudu meat most certainly if you were if that's how you are inclined venison is not something that will be sneezed at by many South Africans in fact many South Africans are thrive and, and survive of venison they have farms where it might be difficult to farm certain other animals but it's wildlife thrives and they will farm venison and they will farm wild animals and that will allow them to be able to you know consume that so most certainly a kudu steak would not be off the menu um, a kudu loin actually is what they generally go after so kudu loin uh, what else do South Africans like springbok fillets are pretty good um, blue wildebeest uh, what else oh, pretty much anything as long as it's um, edible it's generally kind of can be used I have no idea where this leopard has gone because I can't find a track crossing the fire break so I don't know if this leopard hopped back across southwards that's baboon tracks okay I want to go quickly just check the quarry see if there's anything there if there's nothing there then maybe this leopard must be at treehouse dam and if not somewhere in this grassy area and I'm just driving circles around it maybe it's stalking all of these animals and is low to the ground so we have to keep our ears and eyes out very carefully and hope that one of these animals alarm calls and I'll be able to hear them and then be able to see the leopard like that but there's definitely a track for a leopard I drove here yesterday afternoon and those tracks were not there so we know somebody saw a leopard here we just don't I don't know exactly what time I just got an update that a leopard was seen in this general vicinity Let's see any tracks here for a leopard here kitty 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 come on now the reason why I'm spending time here even though I know we've got leopards on the property I know we've got Tumba I know we had Osana and apparently Osana late in the morning one of the guys was out doing roads and he said Osana was inches away from an Impala so I don't know if he caught it or not but we've got both of those options but I just thought it would be nice just to check up on who this is at the end of the day it's a small female track it's in an area where both Shadow and her cub as well as Shongila have spent time before so it's worth checking worth following up and worth trying you never know maybe we get lucky and we can find one of those three because all of those three have been a bit MIA over the last little while and we really haven't seen too much of them so I would like to find any one of those three and spend some time with them as well and we know the girls have a little been a little bit on the quiet side on Juma the young boys have been dominating what's been going on so I would like to try and see if I can find one of the girls now while I explore and try and find exactly where this track goes I'm going to send you back over to Jamie oh I'm not going to send you back because unfortunately it seems as though the picture in the Mara went down so you're going to be staying with me for a little bit longer as I look around for this leopard but there's so many prey animals here that are all so relaxed I find it very difficult that this leopard must be still here unless it's just sitting in plain sight and none of us have seen it which is also very possible at the end of the day leopards are masters of camouflage and this does happen where you can lose them completely so I don't know maybe it is somewhere here I'm gonna try and just sneak up towards treehouse and just check at the waterhole itself because maybe this leopard headed there like I said it warmed up a little bit since yesterday and this morning and so hopefully it's driving it to go and drink 
Right, now it sounds like the Mara has sorted out their Gremlin issue. They've booted them. Jamie's given it a hiking boot to the face and Gremlin has departed and she has some lions and I think they're still sleeping. Okay, so back all the way halfway across the continent of Africa, back into the Maasai Mara, where we've moved around just a little bit to see what it was those giraffe were looking at. And just as we expected, it is one of the other members of the Angama Pride, and she's settled herself very comfortably. Hi, guys on a termite mound. Now apparently a few minutes earlier she actually attempted to try and catch a warthog just before we got here or at least try and stalk a warthog and she's basically having failed at that endeavor she's basically found herself the most comfortable position that she can and you can see giraffe just making sure they keep an eye on exactly where she is. She's the closest lion to them so she's the most likely to draw their attention. And although it is possible for her to hunt a giraffe, not on her own, but together as a pride, lions can and do catch and kill giraffe. It is unlikely that she's going to make that sort of attempt tonight. And the reason behind that is she's got plenty of other options. There's zebra up towards the escarpment, there's buffalo. And a giraffe is a very dangerous thing for a, lion's to, for a lion to hunt. Many a lion has been killed by a kick to the head during a mistimed leap towards a giraffe. It does happen. Obviously, giraffe have exceptionally powerful kicks. You've seen how big their tracks are, so you've got an idea of how big their feet are. You can imagine the force of that hoof. So lions have to be exceptionally careful if they decide to hunt a giraffe, and I don't think that she's desperate enough to take that chance now. Certain lion prides specialize in giraffe. Where I used to work, the lion prides would kill giraffe pretty much, I would say, about once a month or so, along with whatever else they managed to catch on the side. That was because there were very few buffalo for them to eat. And so they focused on the giraffe and a couple of lion prides have learned to chase them over rocky terrain as a way of causing them to fall over or alternatively onto tarred roads. Lovely to hear from you Mr. P as always you say the giraffe in the background is beautiful. Which one, which one are we referring to? I mean they're all lovely. They're all very, very attractive creatures. And I find that it's it's always such a pleasant thing for me still, the novelty of a different species of giraffe, of the Maasai giraffe, haven't yet, hasn't yet worn off. So I always do a little double take when I see them. This one's got a saddle, actually. Or is that my imagination? No, but it does have a saddle. It's weird. It's like, it, it it's almost like the, the it, it was out of focus in that one point on its back. Sorry, my brain is tired of not really making any sense, but you know what I mean. Looks like those spots are out of focus. It's after something. There's something on the ground there that that giraffe wants. Yoshi, um, you say that the giraffe looks like she's very close to the lion. Yoshi, the giraffe at its closest, I'd say, was about 90-odd feet away, 30-odd meters. So it was relatively close. I don't think the giraffe was afraid, though, because the giraffe, you'll often find, not just giraffe, but you'll often find animals that could be considered prey to lions or leopards. If they see the lion, and if they can see that the lion is fast asleep, then they're not going to be, they're not going to be threatened in any way. And that's actually, a lot of the time, why things like impala, giraffe, zebra, and if you watch a, a potential hunt that's failed, you'll notice that the animals don't run far, and then they stop as soon as they know that they're safe. They stop and they stare at the predator. And it's basically a way of saying, okay, there's no point in hunting us. We've seen you. We're going to keep an eye on you, and we are make sure that you're not going to sneak up on us. And the giraffe knows that it'll outrun that lion as well after a while, provided it's got a head start. Plus, she also knows that one lioness is not a threat. Oh, yeah. El 
M? No, the, the giraffe, I'm sort of, I'm starting with the, um, we're starting with the second part of your question first. Um, sorry, lots of people are coming past and asking to take our picture of our vehicle. Um, so essentially, the population of giraffe, I'm actually not 100% sure exactly how many there are in the Mara ecosystem and the Serengeti in total. I can tell you though that they do not migrate. So they're not migratory animals. Yes, we had a giraffe river crossing, but that's because sometimes they want to cross the river. It's as simple as that. All of the animals out here will move across the river every now and again. But no, they don't migrate in the numbers of the wildebeest and the zebra. And certainly you're not looking at nearly as many wildebeest and zebra um, in terms of giraffe numbers. One thing that we do know and that we talk about quite regularly is the fact that although we often speak of the pangolin, the rhino, the elephant, giraffe have also faced a serious population decline throughout Africa. And it's something that's known as the silent or referenced as the silent extinction because the giraffe numbers have been dipping alarmingly throughout the continent. Not here, not just here, but throughout the African continent. I'll find out for you. I'm sure there's a research paper somewhere on exactly how many giraffe there are. I mean, remember, we're looking at about 160,000 hectares that we traverse on. And that, of course, is not including... Guys, that's not including the conservancies either. So the Mara ecosystem is massive and the Serengeti is even larger. But I'll try and find out for you. Try and see if we can get some numbers and exactly how many giraffe there are. In this particular case, I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. So I can tell you that the population of giraffe in this particular exact spot is seven. Odie farming while we unfortunately our giraffe have decided to go for a little bit of walk but okay can you manage to get that one that's reaching up there or is it stopped there's one there under the balanites tree that was stretching up that's it that's the one look watch this stretching right up to try and nibble on the leaves of the balanites tree and it basically is dwarfing the one that's next to it so that's a that looks to me like a large bull giraffe which brings us to the next question about the giraffe's social structure and apologies Chantel my brain didn't even grasp the name if I could hear that again it would be hugely helpful OD farming. Now, OD farming, you want to know about the social structure of giraffe. Giraffe are interesting. They're not territorial um, and they don't really have a set herd structure. They're quite social creatures. They'll gather together in these herds and then sometimes they'll just wander off on their own for a while and decide that they, they're bored of that company and then they'll find some more giraffe to go and join up with. <laughs> Look at him stretching. You'd think you'd go for an easier one, wouldn't you? So they don't have a set herd structure and they don't really have a set hi hierarchy. They're not territorial. The only time you see lions, ah, lions, um, giraffe, <laughs> the animals we're looking at, sorry, the giraffe fighting is between males over a female. Sometimes what you'll notice is there's a general trend that daughters will stay with their mothers. And you can get herds of anywhere up to 20, even 30 animals out here. I think the biggest herd that I counted once was 40. That's unusually large. Ah. Now, speaking of the males and the way that they fight, proud cat mama. Good to hear your name once again. You wanted to know about the purpose of the ossicones, which is the actual official word for the protrusions on top of a giraffe's head. We don't call them horns because although they are solid bone, just like horns, giraffe are born with ossicones. And I'm just going to make life a little bit easier for Craig here. I'm going to shift around so that we've got some space and then we can actually see the lion and the giraffe and poor Craig doesn't have to twist himself right round. Uh, so the, the reasons that they have the ossicones is essentially just for fighting. That is the main purpose of them. And when males fight, what they do... Go. What they do is they swing their necks round. It's a process known somewhat humorously as necking. 
and they swing their heads round and they whack each other on the sides or on the legs, around the shoulders, and they can do some serious damage. And the ossicones just add to that. And if you look at a, a male giraffe versus a female giraffe, one of the things you'll notice is that it's not just the two ossicones on the top of their heads. They've also got protrusions around the front of the ossicones as well as behind the ossicones. So they, they really, they, their heads are built like, I don't know, what would be a good comparison? Um, they're, they're essentially built to hurt. And that's one of the reasons, one of the theories as to why giraffes have long necks. Because it's not just about feeding, and a lot of, obviously always, the theory was always based on the fact that they... Oh, elephant! How lovely. Um, a lot of the theories were based around the fact that being able to reach up higher than everybody else was one of the reasons why giraffe have long necks. Another reason that's been put forward for giraffe as well as for dinosaurs things like Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, is that it's actually a way of, it's, it's a reproductive strategy. So the longer the male's neck, the more he can actually fight with another male. And therefore, over many, many, many years, obviously the males with the longer necks had more opportunity to pass on their genetic line, and so you've got the giraffe ancestors' necks getting longer and longer until you get the giraffes that we have today. So that's that's one of the theories that's been put forward to replace the idea or to to contest the idea that giraffe have long necks just for food. And I mean, it, it ties in because if you think about the really sort of complex shapes of the horns of antelopes, male, male antelope. Okay, let's go back to our stretching up giraffe since it's the only one that's really sticking out its tongue. Unfortunately, it is now really far away. I could go all the way around, but it'll take me, it'll take me too long to actually get past everyone and to those giraffe. NASCAR, a giraffe's tongue is quite rough. It is not as rough as a as a lion's tongue because of course the lion has those spurs adapted for getting rid of the fur on the animals that they feed on as well as cleaning away meat from bone. Um, giraffe tongues are very, very tough though. They're not as rough as lions but they are exceptionally tough. That makes sense because they use them to feed off thorn trees. It's really as simple as that. And so they have dark deposits. The, the tongue of a giraffe is purple and very, very long. It's about half a meter long at its full stretch. And it's purple in color thanks to the melanin deposits which apparently A, help to keep Keep it protected from the sun is something that I've read and a, a lot of, I mean, I remember having a discussion with some of our viewers about that. It seems curious that a giraffe would need to protect its tongue from the sun because you don't really see them sunbathing with their tongues out, uh, but also to toughen it against the impact of thorns. So it's a very, very tough tongue. Highly entertaining to watch them feed and highly entertaining to watch them clean their nostrils with it. As our giraffe make their way away from the lions and towards a herd of elephants in the forest of the escarpment, let's go find out. I know Taylor mentioned she was wondering about the escarpment. Let's go find out if she's had any luck. Just, I think I've spotted something. Yep, I did. Spotted a termite mound. <laughs> I promise you, it looks just like a lion. Anyways, that's, um, yeah, Jamie, no, I'm not having much luck at the moment. The sausage tree pride seem to have uh, given me uh, the slip. So we're looking with the help of our wonderful Ascari, Nasiti, who knows the area really well. So he's giving us a hand. Um, and then that's all that's happening. Um, Chantal, I forgot the question, not the question, but who asked the question? So sorry. Goldfish. Ah, yes, so Sally. Wonderful question for you, seeing as though it is, no, I've got to go down there, we, not Sally, Savvy. Let's see if that's, that sound, I didn't get a, a correction, aha, uh -huh. okay, my bad. So you're wondering what are the, uh, my favorite dishes for Heritage Day, and I was thinking about it, and I actually said, funny enough, two days ago, I really miss Borovos. Now, for those of you who don't know what uh, Borovos is, I say it very English. You can say Borovos as well. 
um, but I can't say that very well. Um, so it's basically a spiced beef sausage and it's absolutely delicious and you can like, flavor them with different things. Normally it's coriander, but now typically you would have that in a freshly baked, we would say a roll, a bun, bread roll, I don't know what everyone else in the world calls them. And a little bit of butter, and then it has to be a tomato, uh, a relish. So it's normally quite a spicy tomato relish with onions. And you put that on, on the bourbons, on the bread roll. That is the best South African dish, I reckon. And it's my favorite thing for heritage today. I think we actually used to try and do bourbons rolls often growing up as a kid. But yes, there we go. So I think that the sausage tree pride has moved out of the area that they've been hanging around in because they go through phases. I suppose they're just moving around within their home range wherever there's animals. So if they move, you know, the lions will move too. So we're checking an old favorite. When I first start, when I first arrived up in the Mara, sorry, <laughs> this is where the sausage tree pride used to hang around. So we're going back, we're gonna check, and if not this one, we'll check the next one. We're lucky, there's actually quite a few of them that run or off of the escarpment. There's lots of buffalo down here, but I haven't really seen much of anything else. Not really any zebra, hardly any topi. One or two impala here and there. But uh, otherwise, it's fairly quiet. But we'll keep searching. And it's also very windy, so maybe these cats have moved closer to the thicker vegetation. Right, we're going to keep holding our hats down in this uh, wind today. Tristan is out tracking. Will he find you all a leopard this evening? Well, we're busy trying. I've just checked Treehouse Dam and the tracks turned back the way we've come and head west again. So I'm going back towards Shibamu. Rexon's in the area helping me, which is great news because he's got James with him. So some of you may know James who helps us out when we have our TV shows as one of our trackers that goes out with Herbie and also a very good tracker just like Herbie and James is on foot and he's walking through this section just to have a little look, see if he can find anything. So hopefully it's going to be between us we'll find her but she went to the dam and has gone back to this side so I think it must be shadow just given the route that she's taken and how she kind of walked back towards the area that she came from so I would imagine it must be shadow and the cub I don't see any sign of the cub track though the only cub track I saw was the one that was on the main road that we first 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 spotted so I think that's the cub track and then since then it's just been this females track walking around here so I'm pretty sure we will find them wherever they are just got to check around but definitely for a female that's for certain so whether it's Shongile or Shadow I don't really know at this stage either one of them will be nice to find I'm not really worried either way so I just want to go back towards Shibamu Pans and back up Shibamu Rex says he's gonna go around from the north and he's gonna let me know if he finds something on his side. But the best way to do this is just to close out the area and to double check and to see what's going on and make sure that you're checking nicely wherever you're going that there isn't a sign of them. So there we go. And Rex, actually I just heard on the radio, Rex has found her. So just to my western side right here, in fact where we're going and driving, Rex has actually spotted her, which is fantastic news. So there we go. There's Rex actually right there and right where the leopard is. So that's very cool now I'm not sure which leopard it is like I say it could be shadow it could be Shongile it could be either one but sitting atop a termite mound I would imagine is where this leopard is actually at at the moment so fantastic news so Senzo says we were just here we were Senzo we just didn't open our eyes very well and we got too sidetracked with the tracks and got too kind of excited about tracks heading towards Treehouse Dam that we didn't look very well on top of a mound because there sits a leopard so curled up on top I'm not sure who it is at the moment it looks like a fairly small leopard hmm, interesting I'm not 100% sure who it's gonna be but we'll check out now exactly as soon as we see the ears it will be able to tell us I vote shadow Lou you say Shungile and Megan says shadow I'm gonna go with shadow as well I think shadow is what we've got here I don't know though, it's going to be interesting. Let's see. 
Mm -mm. Not shadow. I don't. Uh, yes, it is shadow, by the looks of things. So maybe if we just get a shot from there, that will at least give us somewhat of a display of who exactly it is. And sitting on top, pink nose. Yes, it's definitely not Shongile. That's for sure. That looks just like shadow to me. So I'm sure that is shadow that's sitting on top there, which is good news. Now there was track for the cub as well so maybe the little cub is also around here and with us settling down maybe the cub will come back out. I'm not sure how relaxed the cub is these days but it seems as though it moves around with her and is not too unrelaxed so hopefully we'll be able to find the cub coming out. The last track I had for the cub was just south of us coming north so it should be somewhere in this general vicinity. But that's super awesome. Nice. Another female, so we were talking about it yesterday, and we haven't seen too much of the girls, and, well, there's one off the list, and while it's not Shongile, it at least is a female leopard, and one that, hopefully, we will be able to spend the afternoon with. I know the boys are around, but we've really had a lot of time with them, so I'm going to enjoy spending time with Shadow, and there are so many other antelope in this area. There's an impala I can see that is not even 150 meters away, so it'll be good just to spend time with Shadow and see if maybe she's going to go onto the hunt this afternoon and move around so exciting news I'm sure a lot of you are happy to see her <laughs> so I believe a lot of you are very excited to see a female leopard I know we saw Tundi last night well I don't know if we can classify seeing her bum and her tail and just paws dangling as seeing Tundi nicely but this is at least a lot better she's up on her mound and hopefully will wake up at some point in the afternoon. I'm pretty sure she will. The nice thing for her is that it's overcast, cloudy, she can lie on top of this mound, not have to worry about sun beating down on her. It looks as though there's a little bit of a bump on that tummy, so it would mean that hopefully she's had a little bit of food, and that means maybe why she went to go and drink is just after eating, they often do go and drink. And remember yesterday, Rex had tracks for a female and cub that had lost their impala kill and it can only have been shadow it was north of where we are now so it can only have been her and, and she must have then lost her kill to hyenas and maybe this is the after effects of all of that is that she's still digesting a little bit and that's why she's so sleepy and out cold and out for the count at this stage but how wonderful isn't that really cool what a wonderful way to start our drive Right, so James, you say definitely Shadow, I agree, and that's, well, James is probably one of the best people to consult with leopards, he's very good with IDing them and matching up the spot pattern, so I'm glad that James agrees, and it could really only be her in this particular section, and with the nose like that, she's the only one that has that pink nose. Now, while Shadow sleeps, and while we reposition ourselves and get into a slightly better position, I believe Taylor McCurdy has got something, well, that I haven't seen on Juma in quite some time, and is apparently a very big example of one. I've called you away for a buffalo, but look at the size of this fella. This has to be the biggest buffalo I have ever seen in my life, and I wish one of the other Duggar boys would walk towards him so that he, I can show you how he dwarfs them in comparison. Look at the size of those horns, firstly. And he's, there's quite a few other Duggar boys around, and, and they're not, it's not like they're young, but he is taller and longer than all of them. It is outstanding, and like I said, I really wish he would um, he'd just hang tight and not run off and wait for the rest of the group that he's with. That is a, a big buffalo, and he looks mean as well. I don't know if I'd want to get on his wrong side. Look at the size of him. There is only muscle on this buffalo. Now, I don't know what size of pride of lions you'd need here to take down this boy, because we've seen with the buffalo, they don't put up with the lions nonsense at all, and, and they definitely are larger than the buffalo in South Africa, even the other ones. Not, I mean, he's exceptionally big, and, and they struggle to take them down. So I wouldn't imagine how a pride of lions would be able to do this. Maybe those six young males that have been seen quite a bit. Remember, they were trying to take down the hippo with Brent. I think they do that on a regular occasion. Maybe they, this would be an equal match. But wow, he really is big. <laughs> 
Justin, you said lol. I don't think I've ever said lol out loud before. <laughs> so that's a first for me. Um, you have said, though, that um, that disgusted look that he has. I don't know why these buffalo always look so angry. Shame. It must be really terrible, especially imagine trying to make friends and you both look as grumpy as one another. So I just want to show you the others that we've got here too. Just so you can see, I mean, pan across them, they're so much smaller. So these are also adult males. And there's a cow on the left, so you can see she's smaller than the ones on the right hand side of the screen. There is a big breeding herd up ahead, so I think she's probably looking towards them, hoping to catch up. She's obviously just fallen behind slightly. But she also looks very round, so I wonder if she um, isn't due to give birth. There are lots of buffalo calves around at the moment, and she's exceptionally large, isn't she? And not in the and not in the large manner as that big buffalo bull, but in the fact that maybe she's going to have a calf soon. Maybe that's why she's lagging behind the herd. Hopefully, these boys will stay with her to help her. There's another angry buffalo, and another one. And look at the size of their horns. Nowhere near the other boys. Look at that. Small. African pygmy buffalo compared to the one we've just seen. <laughs> I'm, I'm just joking, of course. Nice camera work, Manu. Nice. That was a great shot. Now, Piper Pancake, you're wondering if there would be any predator that would be a threat to this buffalo. Most certainly. Lions are indeed a big threat to the buffalo. Actually, he's just showing off from us now. He snorted and trotted forward, so now he's really standing tall too. Look at that. Ew, no, thank you. I'm okay. I don't think I'd want to mess with this boy. So, so lions would be his biggest threat. Maybe a crocodile if he was brave enough to go down to the river. Although I think one of his hooves to a crocodile would um, not, not be very nice. But they're so tough, those crocs. So. But yes, lions. And I think he's kept a few at bay before. He is honestly an absolute brute. And then, Laurie, you're wondering if the horns of the buffalo are different in the Mara? Uh, no, no, they're the same as the, the buffalo in South Africa. Uh, still, still just made of keratin, so there's no difference there. Uh, and again, it, buffalo's horns are unique, just like people's noses. You know, this buffalo doesn't have a particularly big boss, um, but, but his splay is massive. And then you get others that have got really big bosses, but um, their horns don't sort of go out as wide. They seem to curl back a little sooner, or combination of either or. Um, so again, it, it's just got to do with genetics, if maybe that's what you had noticed. I've seen both up here, big boss or very long and curved horns, some that almost touch the boss again, so tightly curled. He's not particularly young either. I think he's, a, he's in the prime of his life, this boy. Kitty, kitty, bang, bang, you're wondering who kills more of, um, well, if it's buffalo killing more lions or lions killing more buffalo. It's hard to say. I think up in this area is probably an equal match. I reckon in down in South Africa, lions are killing more buffalo. But the other buffalo, they don't play games. I, I mean, if, like I said, now, every single sighting I've seen so far where lions and buffalo have interacted, and this is just up here in the Mara that I'm talking about, the buffalo have won hands down every single time. The lions have not come close, not close to catching a buffalo. So, um, and it always ends up in them retreating and heading towards the lugger, the drainage line, funny enough. It's the same situation over and over again. So these, these, big, um, these big animals have learned that uh, you just got to show a bit of confidence and it's very risky for those lions. Especially when the cubs are running out as well. You don't want the tables to turn. It would be terrible. Wow. Well, there we go. Whew. That was quite quite cool. Actually made me quite nervous to realize that there's some massive buffalo like this out here. I'm glad I'm not doing bushwalks. <laughs> but I'm going to send you back to Tristan who has got shadow. And I wonder how she's doing. I haven't seen her for a very long time. 
Well, Taylor, at the moment, I'm not quite sure. She's lying down. She looks fairly healthy and looks good and as though she's moving around just fine. I was checking her tracks just now, and she's not got any discernible limp that I can see, so I'm hoping that she's moving around okay. It might be a bit stiff after walking, but we'll certainly stick around to find out. It seems as though, you know, she's coming right, and the fact that she survived as long as she has, if that injury was really that bad, we would probably have seen a, a reduction in her condition, whereas, as you can see, she looks pretty good. She's got a slight bump on the tummy, which means she's feeding. We know that she's been on carcasses in the last few weeks from varying other lodges around us, and so that leg must be healing up quite nicely now. It was, at one point, looked really bad, and, and she's even lying on it now. It was her right front leg. So her right front leg was the one that was damaging, or well, that was sore, and she was really favoring the left leg heavily, um, as far as I remember, I think it was. It's been a while since I've seen her walking. But um, if it is the right front leg, you can see she's lying on it, which means that there is definitely not too much pain involved. You know, cats would avoid lying on whatever limb is really sore. And even if it is the left leg, the left leg is firmly down and it looks all okay. So I think she's fine. And if she's catching food, and we know that yesterday she had an impala carcass stolen from her, as long as she's catching food, then she's going to be okay. She'll be able to survive. And the best thing about it is that she's managed, even with this injury, to keep this cub alive and to keep feeding it and looking after it. And it it's really is a testament to that. As soon as now things have been a lot more settled in her territory in terms of the males, is that it's been a lot easier for her to raise this cub now. And she's also that coupled with the fact that we have far less hyena presence here on Juma than we did a few years ago. It means that... You know, she's caught some breaks now and, and, and she's actually done quite well. And so far, Touchwood has been able to raise this female and get her to some sort of independence, which is, I suppose she's not independent yet, but she's at, at that age now where the, the most dangerous period is over. You know, we're fast approaching sort of nine months and by nine months that cub will be pretty street smart and will be able to move around and will be able to know what's going on. And we should have a situation where it should be able to even fend for itself even at this age. We know Tamba, Hosanna, Shongile, they've all been left fairly young. They've all managed to eke out an existence and hopefully Shadow's Cub is at that age now where even it would be able to slowly but surely find food if it was to be abandoned in any way and it will be able to avoid things like other leopard and, and hyenas and the varying other um, sort of threats that it has out here. So she's done well and, and it's it's a positive sign and if you think with Sindile you know, she did quite well with him, got him to a point where he was able to kill something for himself, albeit a rabid dog, but uh, nonetheless he was able to kill and he was able to find a food item for himself and she pretty much did all the hard yards. The fact that he survived obviously was because there was intervention and, and they were treated him for rabies and, and all of that, but that wasn't really her fault. It wasn't a, a situation that was natural. You know, a dog should never have been inside here that had rabies and, and so at the end of the day, it's not her fault that he that Sindile caught it and, and 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 that. So she did well with Sindile, which was the last one, and now you know this this cub that she's got now, she's managed to do quite well with it as well. So getting better. The first little bit of life was not so so good in terms of mothering and, and in terms of cubs success rates, but now in the later end of her life when she's become a bit more experienced and as things have settled, like I say, now with a very sort of settled pattern of Anderson and Tingana, it me and means that she's really had the opportunity to be inside the core territory of a male leopard and that's allowed her then to be a little bit more successful with the cubs that she's had over the last little bit. Obviously she has lost some, I mean she did lose a litter between Cindile and, and this cub and she lost one from this, this litter but at least it's better success rate than, than previous years. When she was younger, it was it was not good. She lost, I don't even know, I think I've seen Shadow with probably seven, eight, maybe even nine litters of cubs in my time that I've seen her. And you know, to only have one young male that <coughs> was aided by the help of people in the end to, to survive, and then now this cub is really not a great success rate. If you compare that to her mother and even her sister, her mother obviously you know, is, a, is just an anomaly in, in the world of leopards in a lot of ways. To only have lost one cub that we know of in her entire existence is just ridiculous and I don't think there's any other leopard in, in the Sabi Sands that has that success rate. Um, but her sister Tandi has, has done quite well of the cubs that she's had as far as, as I've seen. She may have lost one in most of those litters, but she's at least managed to raise 
some clubs into independence. So she was able to do Wabayiza, Bahuti, um, Kuchava, and, and now obviously Tamba is semi-considered to have been raised successfully. At the end of the day, he's a year old. He's kind of breaking, well, he's over a year old now. And he's breaking away from mom. It's clear that she's not as interested in him anymore. So she's done the hard yards there and, and has been quite successful when it's come to raising cubs. So I'm glad Shadow is kind of now living up to the reputation of her mom and starting to catch up with her sister and that she's really kind of been able to keep this cub growing even with an injury, which is pretty amazing. Now those of you probably wondering, uh, talking about Sindile and where he could be and what his sort of movements have been, very difficult for us to know where Sindile is. Unfortunately, that process of him being treated for, for, the, for rabies and, for, and him being collared and all of those kind of things, it's just made him a lot more unrelaxed than he used to be. You know, he used to be such a relaxed individual and after all of that, he just kind of his trust in vehicles and his trust in people waned completely and he's now quite skittish and the last update I had of him was I think somewhere around April um, April May somewhere there he was seen on elephant planes and other than that I haven't heard any updates I know Brent's brother Dylan saw him somewhere in the south of the reserve in Sabi Sabi once but I'm not 100% sure where he's distributed from there. He could be in Kruger, he could be anywhere. And difficult to say. We saw with the data that we had when he had his collar is that he, you know, he shifted and he moved and his, his loops as he was exploring was getting wider and wider and wider. And it ended up that he was going deep into the Kruger, both eastwards and southwards. And so I'm sure he's just distributed into one of those areas. And hopefully one day he pops up on a map somewhere, or pops up in a photograph somewhere and we get to know where he is. But at least he, he, you know, he got away from this area and from a natal area. He didn't get killed straight away. And I'm sure he's fine. I'm sure he's somewhere around. It's just unfortunately a little bit skittish. And that makes following him really quite tough. Also, that collar is no longer on him. So we don't get any of that data as to where he is. He's now a free-roaming wild leopard doing what he wants to do. Now, a lot of you are wondering when the cub for Shadow is going to be named. Well, remember, we generally only name these cubs that are around a year old. That cub is not yet a year. It will only be a year in January, so still some time to go before it gets some sort of naming process. Um, also, you know, at the end of the day, it's not up to us on this side to name it. This cub was born in the west on on Arethusa and Hoffman's area, and they've really they've seen a lot more of her than what we have, to be honest. I mean, we've seen very fleeting glimpses of Shadow and the cub, and we've had some great sightings, but fleeting glimpses to say the least. And so. It's up to them really. There will be a rangers meeting and those guys will, will decide on some names and um, that will be the process from there. Hopefully, you know, it will be around sort of December, January. It's just in time for us to do a few TV shows, I think, that's around that area. So maybe we'll be able to involve everybody in it. But we'll have to obviously chat to the rangers with regards to that. Now... Shadow obviously is still fast asleep. She's still taking it very easy. There's still impalas close by and I'm sure she will hunt them a little bit later. So we're going to be patient with her and while we do that I believe Jamie's got some big pachyderms in the distance. I've got to say, um, and, and Tristan and I have been friends for a very, very long time, and I have to say that I don't think I've ever been more furious with him in my entire life, because now all I can picture is Borobos, and of course we don't get any Borobos here. There is a place apparently where you can buy some, but now all I want is a Borobos roll, and I can't think about anything else, even while I'm looking at elephants, which usually serves to put me in a fantastic mood. All I can think of is how amazing it would be to have one. He's put the idea in my head and it'll take me uh, probably until dinner time to forgive him. All I can think of. Mm. Imagine a Borovors roll now, Craig. It'd be so lovely. It'd be so, so lovely. On a different note of what, what would also be lovely was if these elephants did what I expected them to do, which was come in this direction. I parked myself here because they were moving slowly but surely towards us and now They've all stopped moving, and they've changed direction. So, so much for that idea. It was a nice plan while it lasted, but it didn't work out the way I planned. I've been trying desperately to get a nice elephant sighting, and I've had a few, but never on camera. Come on, Ellies. Say hello. So we haven't left the Angamas permanently. We're going to do a quick loop around their lugger, see what else we can find, what else is lurking around here. Maybe we get lucky and stumble upon a black rhino or something like that. 
and then we'll go back to them as the evening draws to a close. The lovely thing about the Mara is when you do get situations with elephant herds interacting, you can actually see and, and watch it happen. Whereas it's something that we don't always, or not always able to see, hi guys, when we're on Juma. Just because the vegetation is that much more open here, and the landscape is that much more open. Okay, my my elephant plan did not work, but we've got more elephants off in the in the distance. So let's, let me go and see if we can get a bit closer to them, because that's a bit. <coughs> They've also moved slightly higher onto the ridge, so we can't even see them properly. It was not the way I was hoping that scenario was going to play out. And there's a bull up ahead. Let's see. No, the road goes the wrong way. I also thought, well, we might as well look for the male lions as well. Oh, Andrea! You and I share the same first name. I think it was Andrea. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chantal. You and I share the same first name. My first name is actually not Jamie, it's Andrea. But I've always been called Jamie. I didn't choose to be called Jamie, I just always have been called Jamie. But my first name is technically Andrea on my passport. Uh, Andrea, the difference between African and Asian elephants, there's actually quite a few of them. Uh, so one of the big ones is the trunk. In an African elephant, you've got this motion. So there's a, a, basically like a top lip and a bottom lip on the trunk. Whereas in an Asian elephant, it's just a top lip. So it kind of just goes like that. And I'm not stopping now to demonstrate just because there's, vehicle, there's a vehicle behind me. So I'm going to cause a traffic jam if I do. And then the ear size is another big one. The ear size is much, much larger in the African elephant. The Asian elephants have smallish ears. In the African elephant, it's very common for in fact, it's pretty much the norm for both males and females to have tusks, whereas it's quite unusual for Asian, female Asian elephants to... Oh, I think, let me just let go past, sorry. Off you go. So, the... Hi guys. Anyone else? Nope. So that's one of the biggest differences that you'll see. Um, Asian elephants also have a slightly more curved spine. If you look at them in profile, they've got a, a, an almost sort of, I wouldn't call it a humpback, but it is a, it is a curved spine, whereas the, the African elephant has a slightly more flattened, you've got the shoulder, then the dip, and then the rise again of the spine towards the hips. Well, those are the main physical differences. Uh, obviously, there's subtle differences within the way they live. They live in very, very different ecosystems. Their diets are completely different, although their digestive systems are quite similar. So it is, there, there are some very clear differences when you look at them. You'll see it straight away. I also find that with Asian elephants, their skin looks different to that of African elephants. It's not quite as wrinkly. It's got a slightly different sh tinge to it. I would say a slightly oh, a pinker tinge. It's still gray, but there's a slight pinkish tinge to it. And of course, I don't know why this has popped into my mind now, but it's something that I've just thought about. But there are those, Af those African or Asian elephant back safaris. Not something you want to just think about those animals in the wild, how content they are. I'm not sure that there's really an excuse for us to ride them, especially when you read up and see some of the training methods used to convince those elephants to be rideable. Ah, okay, well, maybe I, I assume we're talking about Tristan here. Um, maybe I can't be angry with him anymore or Taylor, because she also raised the Burrowboss issue, because one of them has found something with spots on a termite mound. Indeed, Jamie. And anyway, I didn't bring up the Burrowboss at all. I just talked about a, a barbecue or a braai. I was in no way bringing up Burrowboss, and so this cannot be squarely blamed on me. I think Miss McCurdy has to take some blame in this fashion, in this regard, or this matter as well, because... At the end of the day, I just spoke about that we had good quality meat here. I didn't chat about Borovos. But it seems as though the girls are salivating. And what we'll have to do is maybe send them some photos of if we do have Borovos tonight. Do you think they'll be happy, Senzo? 
Yeah. <laughs> Senza is nodding in agreement that we think we should do that, although I think the girls might punch me the next time they see me. So maybe let's not do that at the end of the day. We've established this week that we should not in any way incur the wrath of the feminine species, and it's better just to try and stay as quiet as possible and trying to just listen and, and to say yes ma'am as much as possible so let's not try to go down that road but you can see shadow is very much um sleepy at the moment she's not moved at all she's taking it completely easier yeah the impalas are still close-ish i mean they're drifting slowly away but there's some impalas around there's some kudu around so i think she's just waiting for sunset at the end of the day in overcast cloudy conditions like this when the sun sets it's going to be perfect conditions for her to be able to hunt so she'll rather be patient wait for the sun to go down and then she can use that cover of darkness because it's going to be a very dark night tonight with this cloud cover it's going to be no moonlight whatsoever and it will be perfect for a hunting cat Piper Pancakes, who is a new viewer, welcome to Safari Live Piper Pancakes. I hope you're enjoying it so far. And you're asking whether or not uh, male and female leopards have different sized territories or if, if there's nothing to do with sex um, and their territory sizes. Well, yes, they do have different sized territories. So what you will find is females generally have smaller territories than the males. And the reason for that is that the males ideally would like to encompass as many females as possible so they're going to push and they're going to move and they're going to try and establish themselves over a large area and try and mate with as many as possible because they want to continue their bloodline as much as possible in, in an animal world instinct is everything and the instinct to mate is huge and particularly in males so they will push as much as possible whereas a female she doesn't care if she mates with one male or five males she just wants to mate and fall pregnant so she doesn't care how many males there are as long as there's just one and um, that will be okay for her whereas a male wants to try and mate as much as possible remember once he does mate with a female if she falls pregnant and she stays pregnant then at the end of the day she's going to be well there's some impala walking in the background so since I've spotted some of them that are drifting but at the end of the day she's going to be out of commission basically for anywhere between a year and two years so he's got to have other options to spread his genes. His tenure as a as a dominant individual is so short that he can't afford to mess around and only mate with a female once at the, or twice at the most. He needs to try and find as many females as possible and try and mate as much as possible to get his genes spreading and going. So males tend to have much bigger territories um, and females much smaller. Here in the Sabi Sands, to give you an idea, male territories are roughly around six to 8,000 hectares. So that's about 14 to 17,000 acres around that area whereas females tend to be much smaller theirs can be anywhere between three and four thousand hectares so much much smaller so you see now she's spotted something so she's picked up her head and she's looking I wonder if she's not spotted some impalas did she spot impalas Senzo? Uh, warthogs is what she spotted so Senzo has seen the warthogs we've got a vehicle next to me so I can't pan the camera too much I'll try and reposition but I don't really want to chase the warthogs too much but you can see how interested she's become there's also the impalas that Senzo filmed just now going around the back so she's now noticed that there's a lot of animals around her and this is the advantage of being up on a termite mound is that the other animals are not picking up her scent her scent is almost higher than what they are and so they're not able to smell her also up there she's difficult to spot she's camouflaged very well and she's sitting right above of their eye lines and so they're at the moment kind of watching and checking and trying to do, sort of look low down but she's up at the top and she can then watch them and hope that they come towards her and then ambush from these termite mounds and I've seen leopards hunting warthogs where they'll actually come down the mound the warthogs feed their way towards the mound and as the warthog rounds it towards them they explode out and grab them so it'll be interesting to see whether or not she actively hunts these warthogs but you can see look at her she's going into a very different position that she can now at least watch what's going on I think we're going to try and reposition a little bit, Senzo, just so that we can see any sign. And we don't want to obviously disturb the other guys that are in the sighting. But they're just in an area where their field of view is right in ours. So I'm going to try and just slowly meander my way forward a little bit. The warthogs ultimately are quite far away from us, so we don't have to worry too much about stressing them. But at least if I get into a position where we can see her and the warthogs, it's going to be a lot easier for Senzo at the end of the day. So. Just want to position ourselves over there. It's, it's, these are going to be a lot of branches in front of her face. So I do apologize about that. 
but at the end of the day she is watching in this particular section and the warthogs I can see them they're very very difficult to see and I don't think we'll get them on camera because it's just their backs ghosting through some dry grass in the thickets far in the distance but it certainly has got her attention and she's certainly watching very carefully what's going on and it's amazing how her reaction is different to kudu and impalas and warthogs so when she saw kudu just now she kind of just opened her eyelid and watched the kudu go past maybe she realized kudu's a little bit big for her impalas she was kind of looking but not really too worried and then the warthogs though she saw that and she's probably seen that there's young warthogs there and that's why she's zoned in the problem is, is she is going to have to watch out for her impala the impala is straight on my sort of left right side here so next to that tree i think it is somewhere there one of those trees is an impala just behind it there it is there sorry that big tree so there's the impala you can see hiding out back there so she's going to have to be very careful because if she moves from there that impala is going to shout that's going to send the warthogs going so her best bet is just to stay nice and patient sit low and wait for the impalas to move off if she wants to hunt the warthogs or she must hunt the impalas which are closer to her so she's got some decisions to make it's tough to be a leopard sometimes you've got lots to choose from Roshni you say suddenly the behavior has changed and that leopards are completely different to lions in that regard and that it's amazing how quickly they go from Oh, yawn, that's a good sign. Yawning possibly means she is going to get going. But uh, leopards are, are very different in that they are very responsive to their environment and to changes within their area. So they will quickly see a prey animal and quickly try and go towards it and, and hunt it and take any opportunity that they can. Lions tend to be a little bit more calculating. They tend to watch and observe. And only if it's something that they really know that they can get will they go into a complete hunt mode. So you'll find lions in the Sabi sands when they see buffalo. That's one thing that do, does drive them to really hunt quite quickly. Whereas anything else is a little bit more of a slower wake up. And then they kind of amble around staring and looking. But with Shadow, you can see she was responsive straight away. Hosanna, we've seen the same. Tumba, we've seen the same. They go from relaxed sleeping positions into full-on active alert modes in the space of about half a second so you could see she was sleeping she was out she was not interested and now she's attentive she's alert ears are facing forward eyes are focused and she's really trying to focus on what's going on and work out a way that she can go so there we go look at her walking much better now I know you she's limping but it really is a million times better although that impala is gonna spot her but look she's at least walking there's the impala shouting at her so you can see her tail will just lift up slightly but definitely walking a million times better than what she was a few weeks ago. I mean, it's not even comparable anymore. She was carrying her foot and now look, almost back to normal. I mean, even better than the, the two weeks ago that we saw her, she's looking a lot better. Look at that. I'm very impressed with her. Well done, girl. You're coming right slowly and with that gait right there, I mean, there's nothing to worry about now. She's getting muscular movement she's putting weight on it so she's going to be okay proud cat mama you're wondering how successful she'll be when it comes to hunting well evidently she seems to be very successful recently i mean she's had a good spate good run of things she was seen in the space of a week she was seen with three different impala kills and a diker she we know that she had an impala yesterday from what was evidence that the hyenas stole from her so she's seemingly hunting just fine um, you know it's a good time of year for her she's got nice dry grass to camouflage very well it's also animals are driven towards water holes and therefore it means that they are actually going to be easier to hunt and so it's actually not a bad time for her to have gotten this injury in a way she's able to basically be able to utilize the animal's weaknesses to advantage but you can see the male impala is actually following her shouting at her as she walks so he's there alert look and he might give a nasal snort again shortly but you see look he's following so the reason why he's following is because he doesn't want to lose visual of this leopard and then think oh mate, mate maybe this leopard is going to come hunt me so there's that nasal snort that you hear there and that's what we will use to try and find her when there we go amazing sound isn't it and you can see it differs it differs from the rut sound which is followed by that gargling this is just the nasal snort and that's how we can tell the difference between the two now she's drifting so I'm gonna try and keep up with her 
Now she's spotting those warthogs. She's going much more alert at the warthogs. The warthogs are going to be on serious alert now with this impala shouting like that. So her hunt is going to be a lot more difficult than what it was earlier. But she's still going to try by the looks of things. She's still kind of moving slowly in that direction. She's still trying to kind of work out a way to find these warthogs. And she sees she stopped there. What she got? She just pounced on something. She missed it. The warthogs went into the mound. You see that? Look at the dust. So she tried to pounce and she missed it. The warthogs were just on the edge there, right on the edge of the hole. And she came from the back and obviously saw them and pounced but missed. So the warthogs went down. There was a big puff of dust as she tried to jump onto them. I think it was a warthog at least. I'm not 100% sure what it was. Maybe a dwarf mongoose. It could have been one of them too. But something definitely went down into that mound. There was dust that sprayed everywhere. And this is where the warthogs were a little bit ago. This is where they were kind of watching from. So I'm pretty sure that what she went after maybe the face of a warthog was sticking out look she's looking down the hole and I'm gonna go forward because she's climbing in a little bit let's see what have you got in here are you gonna start excavating shadow yes yeah, she's gone in look she's going right in and look at the dust so let's see she might pull something out here this is gonna be really interesting look her tails in there there you see look she's struggling what is in there careful girl you don't want to get hurt if you go inside there because you can get a face full of tusk if you're not careful. But she's definitely going deep inside the hole. She's climbing in there, trying to get down towards those warthogs. It must be a piglet that she's going after because I don't think she would try this with a fully grown adult. But she's definitely trying. Oh, lots of dust in the face. Very dusty in a hole like that. What are you after? She's behaving a lot like a male this afternoon, in that males will do this. I've seen Anderson and Tingana both go into mounds like this or into holes in the ground and excavate and then pluck warthogs out like champagne corks. You don't see it very often with females, but maybe she's hungry and that's why she decided to try it out. You can see she is a little bit gaunt. So it was interesting though. Did you see how deep she went in? All it was was a little white tail sticking out. You silly girl, you must be covered in dust. You can see she's sneezing now. So, a lot of dust in her nose and going down her throat. But how cool is that? Out of nowhere, she just went flying towards a hole. Amazing. And there she goes off into the distance. She's now walking. I wonder, she's obviously hungry, which means she's on the hunt and hopefully she's gonna lead us towards her cub. That's what I'm hoping for is that we're gonna have a situation where she's gonna take us towards the cub and we'll get to see the cub. Now you can see the holes that I'm talking about. So these are the kind of holes that she, the warthogs are going into and that's what she went down is something deep like that. And you can see it's almost like a black abyss inside there. So that's obviously what she was trying to go after. But very cool to have seen. It's not something you see very often. So Lou says it was a pangolin. Now the reason why pangolin is on the brain for Lou and for everyone else is because yesterday I had a memory on Facebook and so for... Warthogs, are they coming out? There go the warthogs. You see they're running. Look, they're all running out. So Shadow, if you had just stayed, my girl, you might have had a chance. But unfortunately they've all run and that's the end of that for her. But that's what she was after. It was definitely a young warthog. It was a small warthog that ran. But I was saying yesterday on the on the Facebook thing, I had a memory where I'd seen wild dogs six years ago. And as it turned out, I saw wild dogs yesterday. And then today on Facebook, a memory came up that I had seen a pangolin six years ago. And so I thought, what are the chances that maybe a pangolin pops out and we get to see a pangolin now? Wouldn't that be quite special? So uh, that's why I've thrown it out into the universe and pangolins on the brain for everyone. But you never know, I have seen pangolins twice thanks to leopard. And so it would be nice if we found another one. Oh Shadow, if you had just waited, my girl, on top of that, and that's the difference between a female and a male. A male leopard would have sat at that hole. We know Mvula does it, Tingana does it. They're patient. They'll sit at the hole and they'll wait. And as soon as that warthog exited, she would have been able to grab it and take it. And that warthog that, she, that was there was a fairly small one. It wasn't a very big warthog and she really would have been able to take that. So a little bit of more patience from her and, and an experienced campaigner like she is, I would have thought that she would have shown a little bit more patience. But you never know. Maybe she just thought, mm, this is not the greatest idea. I don't know what's down this hole. I'm going to leave it for now. And, and maybe thought that she, they won't come out as quickly as they do. Peyton, they are some lucky warthogs you ride with. Are warthogs that are very fortunate because if it had been a male leopard in that situation, I can tell you that those warthogs would have been in a lot more trouble 
than what they were. And look at the tails just wiggling now. It's because there's a whole bunch of impalas shouting at her. She's got impalas shouting on her right, impalas shouting on her left. What are you sniffing out inside there? She's smelling something deep inside that bush. What are you up to? Maybe there's a scrub here in there or something that she's smelt. I can hear the impalas to my left. Now I'm, you can hear something squeaking. I wonder if there isn't a little mouse or something or a gerbil or something that's in there that she's heard. That's why she's digging around inside. What are you up to, Shadow? Nope, it's decided that's where she's going to carry on now. Interesting behavior nonetheless, and I wouldn't be surprised after all this shouting she's going to find herself a termite mound and then position herself on one of those mounds and just kind of take it easy. But you can see she's slowly heading northwards and there is a mound coming up so I'm pretty sure that's where she's going to go and sit now and she's going to wait for everybody to calm down, everybody to stop shouting at her so she can then start hunting again a little bit later because ultimately that's what she's going to want is to hunt. If she's hungry for warthogs already it means that she is going to start moving again at some point but if she had just been slightly more patient she would have had a really good chance of catching those warthogs. And we've seen so many near misses We've got to get a live kill at some point with our leopards over the next little bit. Time is running out before I go and leave though. I'm only here until the 30th. And so hopefully one of these leopards is going to provide us with something in terms of a hunt and a kill live. Because we've filmed now, I don't even know how many hunts in the last few weeks. But she's in stalk mode again, so I don't know what she spotted. But her mode of movement has changed completely. I don't know if maybe there's more warthogs. Can you see anything, Senzo? I can't see anything either. But she spotted something. Look at the tail. The tail is a dead giveaway. When that tail twitches like that, means that she's interested in something. She spotted something and she's moving towards whatever it is. So it really is very interesting. I wonder what she's going after. I don't want to move just yet in case it's something quite close. She looks as though she's staring quite close to us. So maybe a little scrubby in the grass. You never know. Maybe a baby diker, a little steenbok. They sometimes will lie in the grass as well. Her movement has quickened up a little bit now. She's not nearly as stalky as what she was just now. Stalky is not really a word, I know, but it describes. It's dwarf mongoose. That's what she spotted. I can hear them. Listen to them. Can you hear them? And her tail's up to tell the dwarf mongoose, stop shouting at me. I understand. But she's hungry, she's stalking everything that's moving at the moment, so she's definitely looking for food. Oh, how's our Ariel going to be here soon? Bobab, you say you're wishing Shadow good luck for her hunt and hope she finds something. Well, hopefully she's going to go onto this tree for us before she finds anything because, well, it'll just be beautiful if she does. It's a favorite thing for leopards to do. No, she's just going to go past it. Or is she? Come on, up onto the tree for us. No, I don't think so. I think she's going to just stop and sniff around. I was hoping she would climb up the tree a little bit. It's not the best tree for her to climb, but it would have been nice nonetheless. She looks as though she's watching it. And often you'll find leopard and lions and cheetah, all of them will kind of climb up, use that for a bit of advantage point. Let's see, maybe she's sniffing around there. It's almost like she's looking for things that are hiding in the undergrowth. See, she's smelling quite excessively. She's sniffing around. Maybe she's picking up the scent of another individual or maybe even her cub. It's difficult to say. Sorry, Senzo. No. Again, she's smelling around there. Now, I wonder if she's going to head towards that mound. The mound is coming up. Just She is walking straight towards it. I'm pretty sure she is going to go up on the mound. I'm almost 90% sure that that's where she's heading. So let's go and follow her forward and see if she does. And let's see. We're probably going to have to push the aerial down. 
Riti, that white on the tip of her tail most certainly helps to spot her. In fact, that's what we look for more than anything, is that white tip. She, it helps us a lot. It really is an expressive part of her and, and it really does give us an advantage to be able to see her. I often have spotted leopards just by that white tip flicking in the afternoon light or in some reason. So it really is a good way of being able to sort of see her. Now there's another hole here that she's come towards. I wonder if she isn't going to just have a little f around the hole. But there we go. You see she's looking down into the hole that I was talking about. There we go. Hello beautiful girl. I'm so impressed with how she's walking though. She's walking a lot better than what she was and she's going to be absolutely fine. The way that she's come right since we first saw her with the limp is really a lot better. So she's looking absolutely wonderful. And I love when they carry their tails like this, when it's bent up and slightly high. And she's got a nice fluffy white end to her tail. So it really does catch the light and it is a beautiful marking. So Riti, it does help us. It contrasts heavily against the environment here and it's something you can pick up from a long way away. So when they walk like this, often the white tail is how we spot them. Beautiful though, isn't it? We're being spoiled, guys. We're the leopards. We have been absolutely spoiled. September has been leopard month for sure. We have had the most ridiculous leopard sightings over September. So we really have been super fortunate in that regard. Now, we gotta wait for these guys just to get around. And their 20 point turn. There we go. Well done, guys. <laughs> so, we're going to just try and take a little bit of a different route because otherwise we're going to be stuck here for quite some time. So let's get round. Senzo, why are you giggling at me? Senzo's laughing at me because I think Senzo thinks I drive like a maniac. I told him though, you haven't seen anything. Wait until you start driving with Brentley as Smith. Then you're going to see what a maniac is in the bush, especially when he follows wild dogs. I was gentle on Senzo yesterday with the wild dogs. I gave him a introduction to dogs 101 on safari and it was a gentle easy situation like i say wait until brentley o. smith gets back here and it's the middle of summer and he's racing after them that's a whole nother level of off-roading and and of racing around and so it's going to be get very interesting when he's back i'm sure rusty and wendy are a little bit happy that they've had a hiatus from wild dog chasing over the past few months now she is mobile and moving again lots and lots of aardvark burrows here that we need to be careful of and lots of little holes you can hear rex had to get himself out of a mess there's a bit of dust in the air now so we're gonna try and get around kathy from ohio leopards do make contact calls they have got two types of calls they've okay hold on senzo has lost Oh, I've lost a jersey actually on a branch. Senzo, will you grab my jersey? Thank you very much. Let me go back. So Senzo's got my jersey. Thanks Senzo, what a champion. So they do have two types of contact calls. They've got a soft kind of, um, how would we explain it? It's, it's almost like a, a little kind of, it's not a meow, but it's a sort of a soft little contact call that they make. It's not a roar either. And then they've got what's called a chuff. Now a chuff is goes something along the lines of and that's how they'll call the little cubs or they'll make this like little cry much like a cheetah call when they are just trying to contact the cubs a little bit further away. The chuff is normally used when they can actually see one another and be able to actually talk to one another like that and they're able to have some sort of visual. The shadow is slowly but surely moving through the golden light. So I'm going to try and keep up with her. I'm going to try and head towards this termite mound that she's heading to. And hopefully she'll go a little bit more stationary there. But while we do that, I believe Jamie is still with her lions. And hopefully they're going to get up and take her on an expedition too. From a beautiful leopard sighting to a really truly spectacular spectacular silhouette of our mountain range. The sun has finally, right at the end of the day, decided to show itself. It's been hiding away for most of it, hidden behind a thin, quite hazy layer of cloud. But the sun has popped out, shining below the clouds, and it looks lovely. That's our home up there. That's where we live. That's Angama at the top. And then off to the right, just where that sort of top peak slopes down, 
That's where our camp is. That's where Chantal is at the moment, directing the show from, well, the top of a mountain. One of the best working views in the world, I think. We've returned back to the Angamas just because it is starting to reach that point in the evening where they're going to be thinking about getting up and moving. Having sat with the Angamas many, many, many a night, I would say that we've got, and this is going to sound really profound, we've got one of two options. They're either going to get up and hunt now, or they're going to sleep until around about 10 o'clock tonight. So basically the options are they're going to hunt or they're going to sleep, which isn't very profound at all. But just from spending time with them, obviously you can't, you can't apply an absolute rule. But generally speaking, that's the way that they manage their days. They tend to be quite late risers. They did much like Shadow, attempt to warthog earlier. <clears throat> no success there. And now they look really contented. I'm wondering where the little ones are. There are little cubs, and whilst the adults might be content to sleep for the rest of the evening, the cubs, generally speaking, will make an appearance and start playing and being bo boisterous as young lion cubs always are. That's some of the older ones, and I think one of the... I think it's the second litter at the top of the termite mound there. That's one of the older cubs. There we go, that one. I think that's one of the the second youngest. But I'm not 100% sure. Hard to tell because it's all tucked up and curled up on the termite mound. They've grown so fast, these cubs. Born at exactly the right time. And as the migration is winding down here in the Mara, and most of the wildebeest have gone back towards Tanzania, very early this year, I might add, the lions have capitalized on the opportunity that they were presented with. <laughs> Izzy, I know. It is the rule with all lions. Hunt or sleep. Um, but that's why I said it wasn't particularly a, really a profound thing to say, was it? Hi, guys. It was rather silly, in fact. So proud cat mama, um, perhaps you have a cat at home and you've heard that they don't see in color, or perhaps you have dogs as well and you've heard that they only see in black and white. And it, it's, a, it's a bit of a fallacy about uh, predators in general that they can't see color. They do see color, um, they don't see in black and white, although they do have uh, obviously quite a large, especially at night, their vision will be gray. But during the day they can see certain spectrums, light spectrum. So they see blues and they see, I think they see yellows as well. Um, they don't see as much color as we see. So they're not uh, primates and birds. And of course I lump us with it within that category. I'll leave it to you to figure out which one. Um, primates and birds have a very color-based vision. It's always interesting to think of, of the way that they must experience the world. And whenever I get answered this question, I always start down this track that doesn't really have an end except for a strange one. And I just, I would love to know, because I don't think we can conceive. Our brains have changed so much and we've sacrificed so much when compared to other animals to make space for other things that we use our brains for. And we don't hear the way they do. We don't smell the way they do. Our nervous system is, is really quite different. And it would be very interesting to experience the world through an animal's senses. And I don't just mean eyes. I just mean senses in general. I think if you were to experience it with a human brain, I actually think you'd be really overwhelmed. Imagine all of the sounds that we don't hear, that they constantly block out. The tiniest rustle, the insects walking around them, a bird landing next to them. Now, of course, we hear some of those things, but largely 
we are our senses are not nearly as acute. Of course, speaking of the way that the animals sense things, lions and leopards would be very similar. I don't want to keep you away from Shadow for too much longer. Let's go back and see what she's up to. Well, she's on the most glorious termite mound in beautiful afternoon light. The clouds have separated, the sun is coming out a bit, and there she goes. Isn't that just a spectacular way to see a leopard up on a tall termite mound? golden light is probably one of the best ways now she's slinking off again she is heading towards another termite mound but it gets so dense and so thick in here it's going to be really very tough to keep up with her but we are going to try there's lots of monkey orange as well so i need to be very careful about the way i do things there's a steenbok over there uh, she's not seen it though unfortunately she's heading in a different direction so unfortunately for her there's going to be no steenbok dinner because she's going the wrong way but I have to be careful with my earpiece in here because this is earpiece danger zone at this stage. It's got lots of monkey orange, which is the perfect recipe for a breakage. So I'm gonna have to just watch where I'm driving and pay attention a little bit today. I can't have an, ooh. Now, I believe that Taylor McCurdy who is also out and about this afternoon has found some sign of gray big pachyderms that well I don't think are gray anymore after having a little swim. I'm so 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 sad and so sorry that I did put not put my foot down on the pedal quicker there was a herd of elephants that crossed uh, the river and um, we maybe missed it by 15 minutes or so it was must have been an incredible sighting especially with this light and this was the last one to cross the river but there's quite a few of them there's quite a large herd off into at the distance but that is just absolutely absolutely beautiful and there were little ones and it would have been so interesting to watch but I saw um, some some friends of mine bumbling about and uh, they said that they've actually seen more elephants crossing the river than wildebeest so perhaps we will get an opportunity maybe we need to come and check the rivers now on the afternoons and the sunset safari what is the time let me check so maybe we need to come through here at about half past five and hang around the some of the crossing points and see if we get these eddies crossing because that could be really really incredible it's um honestly if especially if it's in a deep area and it seemed as though it was quite a deep area i don't think any of the little ones would have stand it's, it's really amazing to see how the adults help those youngsters across um the deep water so that is going to be our mission for the sunset safaris is that we're going to try and find and capture an elephant crossing don't you think that would be amazing but off he walks into the sunset and the golden grass now there's still a potential lion sighting i can try and get to but um i'm going to have to become turbo taylor if i want to get there <laughs> so um it will take us a little bit of time because we've still got to go back up towards Serena. We're not far. I can see the Serena hill, but it's quite a big hill in the distance. So we've just got to go around there. Now I need to find a spot to turn around. And I'll have to turn around all the way here. Fortunately, the way that this uh, road is built, it's not going to be great to try and um, navigate through here. Uh, so. We'll do a big loop around and start heading towards that supposed lion sighting. Hopefully that cat is still around. Uh, Tristan is following a cat of his own and its shadow. Well, we are in horrible stuff though. You can hear poor Rusty is being hit every minute by a tree at the moment. It is thick, it is dense, it is horrible where she's walking but good for her although she keeps walking straight past animals she's walked past three stenbok that i can that i've seen so far and she just kind of keeps missing them all together so i don't know what the story is and why she keeps kind of missing them but she does and hopefully she'll kind of spot one eventually and stalk it but she's now up oh this is going to be nice hopefully let's get around we might get a little sunset silhouette 
is what I'm going to go for here. Oh, sorry, Senzo, that's a big stump. But let's try to get Senzo in line there. How's that, Senzo? So there's the sunset silhouette. It's difficult because the sun is still a little bit high at the moment, but still very, very pretty nonetheless. Very cool. So she's up there, she's watching, she's checking, she's looking around for prey animals. And this is typical shadow. Shadow goes up and down mounds all the time to do this. And isn't that beautiful with the sun in the background? Long grass that is just being highlighted slightly by it. And like I said, it's a pity maybe 20 minutes later because it would be gold, 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 gold behind her instead of that bright sort of sunlight that we've got at the moment. Now, is she going to settle down on top there? I don't know. No, she looks like she's spotted something. So she's going into a different mode. See, she's stalking. She's going on the back of the mound. So she's seen something from up there. I don't know what it is. I can't spot anything yet. Maybe there's a little Steenbok or a Daiko or something like that. And it seems as though she's going to come round the back of this mound. So I'm pretty sure she's spotted something. Her demeanor changed altogether. Nope, she's actually decided she's going to go off in a different way. So she obviously... Whatever it was, she wasn't too interested in, and off she goes. Although it does look like it opens up because, yes, we're on a road. Woohoo! And this is where they had the drag mark yesterday for Shadow and the Cub. So hopefully, she's going to go get the Cub. That's what I'm hoping for. And I'm hoping that's where she's on her way to is to get a bit of Cub time, and that will just be phenomenally good if it is the case because I'm pretty tired of being hit by a monkey orange at the moment. So I'm hoping that this is going to mean that she's out in the open. James, you say you wonder if the leopards take bets on who can j break my earpiece the quickest. Well, yes, it seems like it. It seems like Tingana, Hosanna have got it down to a fine art at this stage. Shadow is certainly trying her level best this afternoon. She's in serious thicket mode and is pushing straight northward so if we wondered where shadow walks around and how she's been moving around in juma today is a very good lesson as to pathways that she's taking and routes that she's following in order to go places because we've crossed over philemon's cut line now it's the big road and that's why there was that short grass and we're now heading north towards the drainage and going up towards rebecca's and we find tracks here normally and we're a little unsure because this is an area that shongile does spend time but it just goes to show that Shadow is pushing in these northern sections and I'm hoping that she is going to go and find the little cub and we are going to see her because like I say this is an area where the drag mark was yesterday this is where she lost that carcass and so maybe she went off hunting left the cub here and we're going to see her if we start to see her vocalizing chuffing and making small little sort of cries then we're going to know that the cub is close by and that's where she's heading I think that's exactly where we're going but I might be wrong I might of course be completely misled and she might just be hunting in this general vicinity but it would just be really strange if she was going into an area where she was yesterday with the cub with a kill and she's now not going to go back to her cub I would find that quite odd to be honest sorry Senzo I know it's thick right there she is just behind the tree She's just watching what's going on. Again, using some sort of natural step up, if you want to call it, just to get a bit of height, just to see, just to have a look, just to work out what's happening. So this is how she'll go. She'll kind of move through, up onto something down, up onto something down, and that's how she'll go. So this is uncommon for her, and I'm hoping one of these or mounds that she gets up she's going to start that typical little chuff which is to call the cub so that's what I'm hoping we're going to see out of her just now but she's still sniffing everywhere Christine, you're asking if it's harder to find leopards during the summer months. Most definitely. It really becomes a lot harder. Water is everywhere, which means that the leopards just kill something and they wander off to a little wallow in the middle of these grassy areas and they don't actually come out onto the roads. Now in the winter, they come onto the roads quite a lot because they are obviously trying to find water and they go to dams and, and, and bigger water sources. So that's how we are able to find them easily. Also, tracking now is easy in amongst this grass. It's sandy, it's dusty, it's 
leaves nice telltale tracks whereas in summer this all hardens up and becomes a lot harder a lot more grass really a lot tougher to find leopards in the summer months so we must enjoy the sightings we're having now because as soon as that big rain comes it becomes a lot more difficult for us to be able to find them and spend nearly as much time and as nicely as what we have today so there we go she's just sitting perfectly behind the branches look at how she's twitching the tail she's looking good though I mean apart from the there's a tail twitch, typical of a leopard. Love that tail twitch. But she's looking good, apart from the, you know, the bit of a limp. Otherwise, she's looking healthy. She's looking young and fit. And although she is aging a little bit more, I often always used to think Shadow looked older than Tundi. I don't know why. There was something about her that looked slightly more mature than what Tundi did. Oh, look at the size of those claws. Those are massive claws. So that's just getting those claws into good condition. Get them nice and sharp for if she does have to hunt and to grab things but she looks good today I don't know why she's looking rejuvenated and young and fresh and that's always great to see when you see a leopard like this is a wonderful thing so right onward we go now to avoid the mil millions and myriads of warthog and aardvark burrows and various other holes that are here as well as the horrible monkey orange we're going to go through again you can see all these small trees are monkey oranges and monkey oranges have these sharp little spines on them and they really are horrible things for a car they pull out brake lines they pull out um, cables that are underneath they scratch the car to all the bare paint it's a horrible horrible tree to drive through and of course well leopards love it particularly shadow she is one that has always since I've known her been a firm fan of a monkey orange thicket she loves to drag you through this kind of stuff I don't know if it maybe entertains her in some way or if there's some sort of reason she likes it but definitely monkey oranges are a shadow favorite that's for sure now, there is a big mound here. She is moving there. She's behind the mound at the moment, so I don't know if she will come to the mound. We're going to sit here and just see if she does. But there she is. Just giving us a little eye. Hello. Call your cub. We want to see your little one and see how well it's doing. Come on. Kathy in Ohio you were saying he has a pretty tattered what do I think caused that well Kathy there's a number of things that have caused that the biggest problem culprit is ticks so as ticks feed off the tips of her ears she scratches and she bites and she tries to get rid of them and and that then causes the ears to degrade it happens a lot in older cats and then the other thing is thorns so as she's walking through it imagine when she chases an impala and she runs and as she kind of rolls with that impala she rolls through a monkey orange thicket thorn into the ear rips a little chunk off so it happens quite regularly with leopard they do lose little bits of their ears all the time with that and then also fighting remember she's fought with hyenas she's fought with male leopard when mating she's fought with um, female leopards and so those all will lead to little nicks and cuts and scrapes and little kind of tears out of the ear now I'm gonna just stay right where I am now because she's literally going to walk straight towards us she's heading in a direction that is in line with us there you go you can see she's coming hopefully she's gonna turn just a little bit uh, no I was hoping the other way but she's gonna cross behind us instead now are you yes you are you're going to go behind us still beautiful either way it's a wonderful sight to see when you can follow a female leopard around it is very cool even male leopards any leopard in the afternoon sun is a treat as far as I'm concerned I just want to wait for her to just go past is she past the sensor yeah. right so she's past and now I can just reverse because I don't want to chase her anyway and you can see with shadow a lot of people always say that she's grumpy she's grumpy she's not a nice leopard she has not once even looked at us growled at us hissed at us she is not a grumpy cat she's a beautiful cat and she's a cat that 
is just doesn't like when people push her boundaries and unfortunately some people have and some people have driven too close to her and, and unfortunately given her a bit of a hard time and that's why she can sometimes be a bit hissy she's also protective of her food and her car and her cubs and that's why she ends up also growling when people get too close to her so she's not a grumpy cat I've never had an issue with shadow and I've never had too many problems with her in the past she just needs her space and needs to be respected and then she's just fine I find actually Tundi far more growly than what she was but look at her she's just stopping she's heading straight towards a drainage line which would be a great place to keep a cub so I'm hoping that's where we're gonna head Oof. thick in here though that's for sure Let's try and change quickly. So back up on the fallen over tree she goes. It's been her modus operandi this afternoon. Sorry Senzo, I know we can't see much of her from here, but let's just try and get around a bit and get her coming towards us. She will eventually, once we get round to this point here. It's not great because there's a number of trees in the way, but, well, it's at least something. So, there she is. You can see she's just watching again from behind the branch. She's looking almost into that sunset. It would be nice if she found a clear fallen over tree to lie on and then she comes down now shadow is slowly but surely moving and heading towards this drainage line whether or not we're going to be able to follow all that way is anyone's guess but while we do that I believe Taylor McCurdy has also got a big cat striding through well a little bit more open plains of East Africa Right, now it doesn't look like much from where we are right now, but it will take us some time to off-road and get into that position. So um, basically what's going on, I'll just introduce to you the scene. It's basically this dead buffalo that is also covered in mud, uh, laying in the grass. And then there, believe it or not, there's two male lions. And it seems as though it's the Chelly boys. I uh, saw a y relatively youngish male. That's about three, three and a half years old or so. And one of them has a collar. And it's just the two of them. And we know that there is a collared male. And we have seen um, them mating with a female before. We've seen them a couple of times now. So they're known as the Chetty Boys. But um, what we will do is when we are off air, we'll go around and reposition. It's just a very long, bumpy way in that won't be very fun uh, to watch. But I don't know if they killed this buffalo. It's hard to say from here. We we'll actually need to get closer to do some investigating to see if we can, uh, depending on how much they've eaten as well, uh, see if, if it's maybe just out of natural causes or perhaps we can see bite marks around the, the muzzle and maybe on the throat. You know, we'll, we'll have to just have a little look and look for typical signs um, that you would see when lions would take something down. But I think that's very impressive if they did take that buffalo down all by themselves. Oh, very cool. So this is the lion sighting we were getting to. I think that's an aeroplane up in the clouds or above the clouds at least. You can just hear rumbling. I really hope we don't get rained on because we're very far away from home. Isn't that beautiful? It is lovely. But like I said, in, in order for us to go any closer, it's going to be some serious off-roading and trying to actually find a spot where we can drive up because at the moment, I don't see a way in here for at least a kilometer or so. It's in front of me and behind me. So it's going to be quite tricky you know, to get back into this spot. <laughs> I 
Right, well, like I said, we're going to try and head around and find a way in here before it gets too dark and too tricky. Tristan is also doing a bit of driving himself, trying to relocate Shadow. Well, Brit is an off, is a bit of a, I think an understatement, Taylor McCurdy. It is been chaotic to say the least. It's been hectic going through here. Now she seems to have stopped in the drainage, so I'm going to try and find a way to get to where kind of she is at the moment. I don't know if she's on the other side or what's happening, but let's try and see if she stopped. So there she is, she's on the other side of this drainage, just still walking parallel with us. So I'm going to try and get into a position where I can actually see her and get a nice view of her. Careful Senzo! Some thorn trees coming up, a few flaky bark acacias in this area that we've got to be a bit careful of. And what about somewhere over here? This should work nicely for you, Senzo. Here we go. How's that? That's quite nice. I think we're in a good position now, which is fantastic. She seems to be, though, still pushing quite hard and moving quite quickly so I don't know if she is going to the cub I, maybe she's just on the hunt but it would just make sense that this is the tracks for her and her cub yesterday in this area she lost a carcass in this area and that's why I thought maybe she'll call the cub but she seems to be on a complete hunting mission she's stopping she's scanning she's up looking down up down up all the time so it's interesting behavior that she's displaying at the moment and you can see why she's hard to find. I mean, in the entire time we've been here with her this afternoon, we've crossed one road, and it was for about half a second, and off she went. And she didn't even walk along the road. She literally just went straight across it and off onto the other side. So tracking her, if you're driving along, you've got to be sure that you're going to see her tracks crossing the road, which isn't easy. And so it's tough. It's not an easy thing at all to find her. No, don't go back that way now. Really, Shadow? So it seems as though she's now going to change direction and head back southwards again by the looks of things. I'm going to try and get round. Ashley, her tatty ears, no, I don't think it will affect her hearing. I think it is a situation where she'll be okay for as long as she's got the main kind of part of the ear she'll still be fine but the, I mean the tattiness is not going to affect her hearing in any way whatsoever um, obviously bigger ears help to trap sound but it doesn't mean that it's going to affect and it's not going to mean that she won't be able to hear she certainly will it's just that at the end of the day they just don't look as good as some of the other ears out here of particularly individuals that are younger like Tumba and, and the likes those ears are obviously going to be a little bit sort of prettier, but other than that, no, it doesn't really affect too much. She is coming up straight towards us, so we're just going to sit tight where we are. should see her just popping out on the edge of that mound. There we go. There's that beautiful big tail of hers, and she's coming straight towards us. There is another mound just on my other side here, and so hopefully she's going to head up onto that mound. Thank you, Shadow, for coming this way. It was a good decision to stay this side of the world because she's walked, well, as you can see, right in front of me. So sorry, Senzo, my hat was in the way there. But there she goes, there's the cold front disappearing, goodbye cold front, in the background. So hopefully that's the last we see of that for some time. There you can see the edge of the front pushing off and away from us. So that will be a very grateful goodbye to that cold front, because I have not particularly enjoyed it at all. It didn't bring any rain, it was just cold, it was windy, and very unpleasant. So I'm quite happy to see that one go. That one can definitely find its way somewhere else and leave us alone. Now what's she spotted now? She almost seems as though she's found something. Pretty sure she's going to go up this mound as well. There we go. So you can see she's able to climb right now. She's not doing too badly. I'm going to try and get myself around onto the other side of her. Again with maybe the sunset. Although I think she's a bit high for the sunset to be honest. She's stalking something that's in the grass here. I don't see anything, but she's almost looking right at us. Look at that. Look at how she's gone into a different mode. What have you seen? I don't see anything, Shadow, and I'm right here. Where she's looking is literally, I, it must be a meter away from me in front of the car, but I can't see anything. Super interesting. 
Look at how she's poised. Look at that front leg just slightly lifted. She's focused. Look, she's just putting the paw down slowly. And she's bent in almost like an S shape, staring straight towards where we are. So I have no idea. I can't see anything. Maybe there's a little Franklin. What's that? Did I see something moving there? No, I can't see anything. But she's definitely watching something that is fairly close by. So I, what it is, I'm not sure. Maybe there's a little Steenbock or Diker that's hidden in the grass. And from our angle, we can't see it. Remember, she is higher than what I am. And so she could maybe spot something that I can't see. But definitely intent on something. And she's stalking. She's low. She's trying to keep her body down as much as possible and keep her sort of noise level down as well but look at how beautiful that is with the sun in the background her up on a big termite mound and there's a ridiculously good sunset unfortunately we're probably going to miss it because i want to stay on shadow while she's still stalking like this what have you seen shadow i'm not going to move at all because whatever it is i don't want to disturb it but it seems as though it's right in front of my car and i honestly cannot see a single thing oh there i can see it so look in the grass here, Senza. So in this grass on my right hand side, just hidden, is what looks like a diker. So if you follow my finger, Senza, I'll show you. Just to the left of this tree, at the back there, where my finger is there, is a diker. Now it's very difficult to see it. There it is. You can see its ears just poking out through. Is it a diker? I can't see it nicely. Or is it a stump? It looks like something there. No, it's a stump, is it? Yes, it is a stump. Sorry, I thought that was a dike. I thought I saw some movement there, but it is a stump. Sorry, Senzo, my fault. But it looked like a dike, and it looked like movement. The grass is just moving a little bit, but that's what I thought she was staring at. It's in the right kind of direction for the way that she's staring. So that's what I thought she was looking at, but obviously not. Oh, it's a scrub here. Dryden, you're saying, do you think she's ignoring dikers because they're too fast for her and she's lame at the moment? No. I think it's just a fact that she's just looking for something that's easier to hunt. There's a scrub here is what she's actually hunting. I can see it now. It's right here next to the tree. So she is hunting a scrub here, which is on the other side of this thicket. So where she's going now towards there is where the scrub here is. So I don't want to move because the scrub here might bolt if I move. But the scrub here is just on my right-hand side. Where she's going, she's got to come around now through a tree area. And then the scrub here was on the other side of that tree. So it's going to be difficult for her to get there. But she is going to go into stalk mode. She's going to go very quietly now and she's going to have to tiptoe because this rabbit or scrub here should i say not a rabbit naughty tristan is that very aware that something's up it's alert its ears are up it's looking around and so she's going to have to try and now watch and just move slowly and quietly and sneak her way to a proximity that she can stalk we saw this with hosanna the other day how he edged his way closer slowly but surely trying to get towards her and hopefully shadow is going to be the same so let's see how she goes but she's edging her way slowly 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 look how she's just watching head is looking she doesn't need to be as camouflaged with this as something like a diker or a impala because at the end of the day the scrub is so low in the grass that it, the field of vision is very slim because of all the grass moving around it it relies on its hearing a lot more than something like a dike or a steenbok or an impala so she can afford to be upright and quite high up but as she gets closer you'll find she'll get lower and that crouch will become more sort of of a stalk and more similar to what we saw from Hosanna than what we're seeing now unfortunately she is going to go behind a really thick bush in order to get closer but look at how she's moving that back foot gently slowly just trying to touch it down just trying to make as little noise as possible not to alert the scrub here to her presence and she's going to slowly push her way forward and try and get a little closer the thing about scrub hairs is that they do have very good vision and i mean very good um, hearing and their vision's not too bad particularly as it gets darker so She's going to just have to be patient and slow and steady. But I'm sure in her lifetime, she must have ended a number of different scrub hairs lives. So she'll know the technique. She'll know how to do this and know how to be able to hunt them. So it's going to be interesting just to watch her as she moves around. And I would love to know what her success rate with scrub hairs is. I've seen Shadow on 
at least nine or ten different scrub hair kills so it's obviously something she actively partakes in hunting and so I would be interested to know just how many she's hunted in her time and how many and what her success rate in percentages between that and maybe something like Daiko or Stian Mok or Impala and maybe that's why she targets them maybe she's figured out a much better way of doing things but you can see look she's just behind the bush now she's gone a lot lower already and she's slowly but surely creeping her way forward. Unfortunately for us, we're going to have a lot of bush in our way as she goes round it. And I can't move any further than what I am now because that scrub hair might just get a fright and run. That scrub hair at the end of the day, like I said, knows something's up and knows something's going on. So we want to try and give it, it everybody the best possible chance to survive or to, be, you know, to hunt. And so, and so we try and and not interfere as much as possible and I know a lot of you are wondering how our vehicles here would affect something like this well in this situation when we sit still and we don't move the scrub here I can see it it's grooming itself it's not making any movement it's literally just rubbing its ears and having a little nibble on some grass so it doesn't know shadows there we're not between the scrub hair and shadow and therefore we're not protecting either one of them or hiding the other one we're just sitting and we're waiting patiently and we're allowing it to play out and that's why we won't start the car because a noise will disrupt both of them and that will run away so as soon as we see an animal go into stalk mode we try and keep ourselves as sort of non-obtrusive as possible or non-intrusive should i say and we try and kind of keep ourselves still and not move around too much not try and create too much movement around both animals we would also if it was at night we would make sure no lights were on we'd try and keep it as sort of natural as possible and leave nature to take care of itself obviously that's also why i'm speaking in a much lower tone then maybe I would normally, as I'm trying to keep my voice down, I don't want to have a situation where I'm distracting either party from what they're doing. At the end of the day, it's a battle of survival. One animal is desperate to eat, the other animal is desperate to survive. And so we don't want to give an unfair advantage to either one of those. It's completely unethical to do so. So we're going to try and be as patient as possible. And it means sometimes we don't have the best view of them, as in a case like this, as they're stalking along. And, you know, we just have to be patient and wait and just be sort of quiet about what we're doing and, and allow nature to take its course so in a situation like this we're probably perfectly all right we have a situation where everybody's quiet everybody's taking it nice and easy and so we should be just fine in terms of not interfering in any way but look at the focus you can see she is completely focused on that scrub here she's watching she's listening her ears are not moving at all you can see her ears are focused straight forward as to where she's looking and the scrub here is looking away from her at the moment so the scrub here's got his back to her which is what she wants she needs to be able to move slowly and try and edge closer towards that scrub here without giving it any sort of visual and she'll have to get probably maybe another i would say she would need to get another five or six meters in front. So the scrub here currently is just somewhere in this general vicinity underneath this tall tree in the background. So that's where she wants to kind of head her way to and try and sort of stalk to. So it's going to take a little bit of time and she'll probably have to close the gap to at least half of what it is now before she would have any real possibility. We saw the other day with Hosanna, even at a close proximity that he was, he missed that little scrub here. So, you know, it's it's difficult for them. Scrub bears are fleet-footed, they're fast animals, and so they've got to get really close and then ambush them with a quick leap up and onto the scrub here and hope that they then grab it. So. I'm pretty sure Shadow knows though. She's sitting now, so she's conserving energy. She's not in a position where she's holding a crouch pattern where she's going to start getting muscle fatigue. She's sitting down, her bum is down on the ground, and she's just waiting to see which way is going to be better. And I think what she's hoping is that the scrub here goes into deeper grass. That is a little bit more difficult for her to be spotted. And that's when she'll start moving. At the moment, she's got very little cover between where she is and where the scrub here is, and, and that's going to make it difficult for her to get any closer than where she currently is now but now becomes the waiting game and leopards are patient animals I've seen leopards sit as we know with them Vula he once sat for almost 24 hours at a warthog hole waiting so they can be very patient and they can take a long 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 time to hunt they tend to be a much sort of more patient than any of the other predators that we see so we know wild dogs lion and even cheetah tend to stalk chase and move quite quickly whereas with these guys is that they will play the patience game they will slowly edge their way they'll slowly move if they have to until they get in striking distance and are able to then get to what they want so this could take five minutes it could take 
10 minutes, it could take an hour, it could take maybe even two hours. It just depends on how Shadow goes about it and how she kind of positions herself and whether or not the scrub hair sees her. At the end of the day, she's going to try and stalk there without it. If the scrub hair does see her, we're going to have a situation that she's not going to be able to probably follow. Um, Senzo, maybe you might see it. Uh, no. If you go a little bit up from there, so just to the left of that, there, you can just see its backside. There it is. Straight in the, so the left of that big trunk. It's there in the background there. Somewhere. It's more towards the back, Senzo, more towards the back, left. Oh, Laramua, you say their patience is incredible. I think Senzo, unfortunately, is at a bad angle to see it, but it's it's behind that stump, that tree trunk that we can see in that frame. So a little bit to the back left of that is where this scrub hair is sitting. Somewhere there is where it is. I don't know if we can find it in, in that. There's so many branches in between, but that's where it's sitting. I think, unfortunately, Senzo is not in a good place for it. But they are incredibly patient animals. I mean, Shadow is... The whole afternoon she's been after things. Also, it's starting to get darker, which means it's starting to get a little bit better for her. The darker it gets, the more she can sneak around without being noticed. It's still quite light. The scrubby's got big eyes, like I said, big ears, and it's able then to pick up movement around it. But as it gets darker, it becomes much more into Shadow's favor, and she's maybe that's why she's just sitting tight, waiting a little bit, hoping that the scrub here maybe just moves into a little bit more thick area that she can then try and follow without being seen. At the moment, it's difficult for her. Now, the scrub is still sitting there. I can still see it. It's just got little pink ears. When, like I say, Senzo, you're going to really battle to find it. You won't be able to see it. It's quite difficult. It's sort of in and under where Senzo is looking, but maybe, I don't know, it might be possible. So, somewhere there. It's just too thick, and the problem is for the camera to get focus in all of that is so difficult, but that is exactly where the scrub is in that general vicinity. Maybe just try going a little bit more to the left, Senzo. Behind there, no. No, you won't be able to see it. Cat, yes, it is true that uh, Shadow was originally named Tink... Well, okay, so there is two schools of thought here because she did have the name Tingana. It's not that she was originally named it. What happened was here in the northern part of the reserve, so Juma, Bufuzok, Torchwood, those guys, and Cheetah Plains, they named her Tingana and Tandi um, Saseka. And the guys in the western side, so Arethusa, Elephant Plains, Chitwa, um, and Koro, those guys named them Tandi and Shadow. And the reason why is because Saseka was a the mother of Salahesh. And so the guys said, well, we've already got a Saseka. We can't have another Saseka. And so they called Tandi, Tandi, and they moved away from Saseka. Shadow was called Tingana for a while. And then what happened was she was changed. It was accepted that her name must change to Shadow because Tingana, the male, arrived. And we couldn't have two Tinganas. And so that's kind of how it happened. But the guys up north here referred to them as um, Tingana and... Suseka and the guys into the west and south of us referred to them as Tato, Tandi and Shadow even from the beginning. So it was just a bit of miscommunication and, and that's why things kind of changed. But you can see, look how low she is now. She's down, she's sitting, she's crouching and watching what's going on. She's really got herself as low as possible now. And she's kind of going to have to leopard crawl her way as we saw with Hosanna the other day so for those of you that missed it leopards have a, a little bit of a floating collarbone which means that they can push their whole body down and just their legs will stay up and they can then scrape their body along as they kind of crawl their way forward and that's where leopard crawl comes from as people we know the, the, the word leopard crawl and that's where it comes from and they'll try and kind of keep their body down as low as possible and then just slink their way almost slithering if you want to call it that towards this scrub here but she is as low as she possibly can be she's although she's gone into a bit more of a relaxed position now she doesn't look as though she's got her paws too far forward and it does look like her eyes are even closing as well shadow are you falling asleep while watching her scrub here really no there we go she's attentive again scrub here still sitting exactly in the same place it really hasn't moved at all, so it's still in that exact area. And if the scrub hair moves, she'll be able to pick it up from this distance with her ears. Also, we know she spotted it as soon as she came over that mound. She saw that scrub hair with 
in about two seconds. It didn't take her long to spot it, so I'm pretty sure she can still see it. But you might find that she does just take a bit of a rest, and as soon as the scrub hair moves, she then moves as well. Now, I see the scrub hair is feeding now. It's just starting to kind of feed and groom itself, and that's maybe why she's perked herself up a little bit and become a lot more attentive. One real human, you say, wow, what incredible camouflage. Well, it is. I mean, that's zoomed in fully. So if we come back a little bit, keep coming, Senzo, keep coming, keep coming. There we go. Try spot that. That is really not easy to see at all. Her spotted coat in amongst thicket like that is pretty much invisible. You, you really don't see much of a leopard in that image at all. Well, I certainly can't on my little monitor. I don't know about you guys at home on your screens, but... I don't see very much at all. So their camouflage is absolutely unbelievable. And it's why we often drive past leopards. Like I say, it's, it's common for us to miss them completely. And if their tail isn't up or they're not head up and they're crouching down, you can bet that you can miss a leopard a lot of times. So it's an incredible camouflage and, and one that has to be the case because ultimately, remember, they are ambush predators. And if they don't have camouflage, there's very little chance that they're going to get the food that they need. They don't have the speed that you'll see of something like a cheetah or a lion, even they're slower than lions or wild dogs. And so they've got to be able to really get close. And to get close, you've got to be able to conceal yourself in plain sight. And so that's why a leopard's camouflage is as good as it is and why they're able to blend the way that they are. Scrub is still just sitting, still taking it easy. It's not really moving around. Senzo, you might be able to see its head bobbing up and down now. It's, it's sat a lot more upright than what it was earlier. So it's possible that Senzo might be able to pick it up just there, Senzo. So it will be somewhere under that kind of... There, it's moving now. It's just moving off to the left. So it's going to be probably more difficult for you to see because now even I'm battling to see it from where I am. But you can see she's up now. She's she's moving. Look, you see, she's now starting to stalk again. The scrub hair moved, so she's moving. And this is how it's going to go. It's just kind of a ping-pong game a little bit. She's going to want to position herself, and hopefully that scrub hair is going to walk towards her. So every time the scrub hair moves, she moves. Now, see, the scrub hair is coming out now. So now you'll be able to see it quite clearly. It's going to come out into a gap here. So there it is, just there. You can see its ears just wobbling around moving in that direction there it comes slowly emerging and so we'll keep on the scrub hair for now because as the scrub hair starts to come out so shadow will then have a thicket to work with and be able to pounce now that scrub has got no idea i mean it's busy eating it's got no clue that there's a leopard in sight and a leopard close by and it's just busy eating its dinner and starting off its nocturnal movements and that's why they head towards roads because it's so easy for them to be hunted in places like this and so that's why the scrubby will start to head towards roads a little chomp on some tree and some foliage and that's where the scrubby is and then shadow on that side so shadow i think his best bet is to come through here my girl I'm going the wrong way but look at how she's watching now she's trying to see over the grass where's this little scrub hair gone and she's now trying to work her way around and get a little bit closer towards the back and you see how she's trying to hunt from behind the scrub air. She's trying to move her way around, get in behind where the back end of the scrub air is and slowly but surely move her way forward. Once she gets there right behind it, then you'll see a big spring, much like you see where I'm a serval in that way. Look at how her paw goes. Look, how amazing is that? You see how she's tentative. She says, no, nope, that's not the right place. As soon as she meets a little bit of resistance with her paw, she'll stop moving it. She does. She knows if she touches something, that's going to make a noise, and so she'll stop. The scrub hair is still right where it was. It hasn't moved too much. It's a little bit more in the open now and sitting out. So there we go. There's the scrub hair a little bit more out in the open. Better for us. And Judy, you saying, take your time, Shadow. No need to rush. Exactly. There isn't any need to rush. We've still got lots of time. And so I'm pretty sure Shadow can just slowly meander away closer, work her way closer. And if she can just get into this thicket, maybe that scrub hair will even feed straight towards her and she'll be able to then hunt it from there. So she's just kind of working out which way she needs to go. And she's a little bit undecided. She can kind of putting a foot forward and then she takes it back again. I think she's trying to see if maybe the scrub hair moves the, in a different
different way that she can then cut it off somewhere and lie and wait for it and hopefully the scrub bear then comes right towards her. That would be ideal obviously for her situation is if the scrub bear walked right into her direction. You can see she's just watching and seeing and working out which way she's going to go. It's impressive though that the patience that they exercise All just watching and the scrub here is now facing towards her direction and is quite upright so her movement now will be quite easy to see so she needs to be patient and you'll find once the scrub here turns like it has now you might find her moving so you see the scrub here turned and his back is to shadow now so she can now start to think about moving look at the tail starting to twitch <laughs> and don't let your tail give you away sometimes it's almost like the tail is too excited for the body and it gives a leopard away and kind of starts twitching long before it should be twitching and <laughs> they get seen so Shadow you'll have to control your little tail and there's the scrub bear you can see he's feeding quite upright and facing a little bit towards Shadow that's why she'll have stopped again but it's a fairly good meal for any leopard it's, even though it's small it's still it's still good nutrients and Kathy you were saying exactly the same thing even though it's small it's still our girl needs a good meal and exactly that that's the thing with these animals is is that it might be small but it's nutrients and and for a smallish leopard like Shadow or Tumba or Hosanna it definitely is going to fill the gap for at least a day and it will make them not feel as hungry so perfect thing to be able to hunt and to be able to try and go after so for her it is is a, a an easier meal it's easier to come part come upon them and to be able to kind of stalk them it doesn't take nearly as much energy as something like an impala so she can afford to hunt these more often and, and again they're more common so she'll come across them fairly regularly and it's good nutrients we saw the other day with Tumba with his and we've seen her like I say with quite a few now that the scrub here just bounced and so she's now looking very intently I still think her best bet is to come between us in this thicket through this little thicket and sit on that left side of this tree and hope that the scrub bear starts moving but the scrub bear's now gone into long grass so I think Shadow is going to make a move now I don't think she's going to stay where she is for too much longer you can see she's still watching oh, I wonder where she's going to go from here on the edge of your seat stuff it's it's amazing just to watch the calculated nature of an of a leopard and how it sits and watches and, and plans to execute the the way that it's going to move Ryan the leopard is not exactly downwind but the wind is blowing from sort of a northeast to a northwest so it's coming across from my right to left so basically the same for the scrub here and the leopard is right to left so the the scent theoretically shouldn't blow towards that scrub here and um, hopefully I mean obviously it can swirl around a little bit and there can be a bit of movement but it theoretically should come from right to left and shouldn't interfere in this particular hunt I've lost the scrub here completely now I can't see it anymore it's, it's drifted into that very long grass patch uh, can you see it still, Senzo? Okay. So it's in the long grass patch now, which I can't see, but I think Shadow's best bet is to come back towards us and then snake her way through this thicket and get herself into a position where she can then go towards that long grass, or she could just decide to go that way. I still think her best bet is this way, but anyway. There she goes. She's just going to ghost her way along. And I can promise you, sitting here, that there is not a single sound being made by this leopard. I have not heard her. I have not heard her walking. She is silent, 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 silent. I can hear the scrub hair more than I can hear Shadow, even though Shadow is way bigger than what that scrub hair is. It is absolutely amazing how silent they are when they want to be and how they just stalk slowly and quietly through these areas. You'd think thick bush like this. If I walk here, I'll make a lot of noise. and You'll hear me easily or anybody that walks here. But her is nothing, nothing, nothing that you pick up. I've even followed lions through places like this and they make a lot more noise. But leopard... They are silent animals when they move. It's amazing, actually, to hear how quiet they are. I'm not sure she's going the right way, to be honest. I think she's heading completely the wrong direction, unfortunately, because she's taking herself 
into a more open patch. I, I suppose I can't really see what's behind this tree. Maybe she can see a path that I can't, that is far more concealed. But to me, where we are now seems to be a lot better. Or even use the termite mound that we've got on our left-hand side and you stalk along that termite mound towards the scrub. It would seem to me to be a better way of doing things. But then again, I'm not a leopard. I've never hunted a scrub here. And so I might be completely wrong. She seems as though she's now wandering off a little bit. So, Barbara, the difference between a hare and a rabbit is scrub hares come out at night. So they are animals that spend their time out at night. Longer ears, longer legs, give birth to young that are able to move around straight away and are given they give birth to them in basically dusty little hollows under a tree whereas a rabbit diurnal shorter ears shorter legs hops rather than runs and spends its time in a burrow where it will give birth to young that is not able to move around and is very reliant on its parents so slightly different in the way that those two animals work uh, she is moving to a place where we won't be able to see her i can't see the scrub here either so we're going to sit tight and just wait rex is moving a little bit just to try and keep view of her because we don't want her to drift off sometimes leopards do this sometimes they get to a point where they've watched they've seen and they realize well there's not really a chance for me to hunt this and they might then move off out of that area so we'll just see i have seen it before where they've stalked for half an hour and then they just decide no it's not worth it and off they go and carry on so i'm going to just sit here and see if she starts snaking her way back rex is going to stay with her exactly oh, here she comes here she comes Senzo, look she's gonna come out and she's moving quickly now and is low to the ground so she's just behind that thicket slowly but surely moving down towards the scrub here now and it's getting dark and dingy and the perfect light for her to do so it's also getting a lot colder now but there she comes see her look, she's walking a lot faster there she goes no unfortunately for her that is Amos Sorry, my girl. You can see how fast that scrub hair is. She tried, though. She tried her very best, and she, unfortunately, she just overcooked it a little bit. If she had just slowed up towards that thicket and sat, she might have been a lot better off. She, if she had just showed that patience there, we would have had a situation where we might have actually seen her grabbing that scrub hair. But nonetheless, interesting and certainly very riveting to watch. I thoroughly enjoyed every little second of that I hope all of you did as well but now we carry on on our patrolling mission it seems as though she's not heading towards a cub given that she is starting to kind of stalk everything that she can and so well I think we're going to be carried a long way now and carrying on on the hunting that she's going to be doing now we're going to try and keep up with her as she starts to get moving but I believe Jamie is still with her lions and I think they're in a state of far more relaxation and well I think they're just taking it very easy this evening. So Shadow is being very exciting this evening as she goes about searching for her dinner. I wonder how big her cub is now. I can't wait to see screenshots of it when Tristan finds it once again and I'm sure he will in the course of the next few weeks. We're still with the Angamas, still watching them as they go about their slow evening movements. All 13 cubs are present and accounted for. I did a head count when the rest of them popped out of the lugger that they like to spend their days in. They're all sort of scattered about in a puddle around the drainage line. Now the amazing thing for our new viewers, for those of you that are new to the safari, it is basically completely dark now. I can't see them at this point with my own eyes, but we've got this amazing low light camera that allows us to view scenes just like this one and it makes use of absolutely every ounce of available ambient light. I suppose you can't really say ounce of light, but let's go with it. Oh, flop. You're too sweet. I can't believe how big the oldest cubs have got. Little males have got their manes starting to grow, tufts around their cheeks. Too sweet. Of course what that means is that for the remainder of the sunset safari we'll stay with them and see whether or not the ladies have any plans. Cheryl, you say you love the brown spots on lions. I do too. 
And of course, the cubs have far more prominent spots than the adults. And then when they're born and when they're very tiny, they're actually basically spotty little cats. And it's a great way of helping to camouflage them and keep them safe from discovery when they're little. And although those spots fade over time, they never disappear completely. I like the spots too. It's an endearing reminder, especially in the adults of a time of their lives when they were just tiny little vulnerable creatures. Hey, there's one of the little ones. Hey, you. Even you've got big. Popping out of the thickets. Oh, that's a lot of lions all cuddled together there. Little one wants to be in on the action. Kathy in Ohio, yes, absolutely. It's it's as green as it is because of the rain that we've had. So it's essentially, I mean, the, the herds of wildebeest that came through have acted almost in a way like a fire. They've cleared away the grass, they've cleared away the moribund material, and it it is almost like a fire's been through certain parts of this reserve. And that, that's not because there has been a fire, it's because the, the wildebeest have gone through. But you know how after a fire, when it rains, and a couple of weeks later you get the green shoots, well, actually a couple of days after rain and after a fire, you get the green shoots sticking through? It's just like that. Is it cold? It, it you know it it is it is cold. It does get cold, particularly around about that sort of two three o'clock in the morning mark, and especially if you're driving. Again, it 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 never gets as cold as it does in Juma over the winter. I would say it hovers somewhere around about in the dead of night, somewhere around about fifteen or so, fifteen sixteen. It it does feel cold after when you're out all night. And when the wind howls, as it is at the moment, it, of course, drops the temperature by a few degrees. I wouldn't say we're nearly as cold as we would be on a mo winter's morning in Juma. I can hear something, but I can't work out what it is. And Chantal tells me it's 20 degrees. Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I've never been the bravest person when it comes to cold, but I'm wearing a jersey and a jacket and a scarf at this point, which I, I sell that would be overkill for 20 degrees, even for me. Uh, um, I would say that the thermometer might be a bit confused, <laughs> would be my guess, if I had to be honest. It definitely feels, it definitely feels colder than that. What would you guess the temperature at, Craig? 15? 16? Mm. Around, there. Around there, says Craig. Maybe it's just because we've been sitting still in the wind. Perhaps Chantel's thermometer has got it spot on. I actually don't even know where that thermometer is. The weather station. Come to think of it. I don't know exactly. Such a peaceful evening. It's been very peculiar. It's been a very quiet few nights. In the nights that we've been out driving around, the lions have been silent. Last night was different across the other side of the river. We sat with the ridge pride, and, and as these things go, unfortunately they killed the wildebeest. They killed three wildebeest just out of our signal range, and just went in the wrong direction. Pancakes, that's a difficult one because it depends on it depends on what you're observing and it depends upon the the situation that you're in. So Piper Pancakes question is about how much time we actually spend driving around versus um she's seen something, I'm just trying to see exactly what it is, versus actually spending time observing the wildlife. Sometimes we come down the hill and we sit with the sausage tree pride an hour into our drive and, and we sit with them for the next potentially 20 hours in the past it has happened um, then occasionally we we drive for three hours to get to a destination that we want to get to if for example I wanted specifically to go and find the cheetah boys the musketeers I would probably have to drive for around about three hours to get there possibly even more around about three and a half 
if that was my specific objective for the day. So it really is circumstantial. Um, and I'm not sure if I could average it out. Obviously, the distances that we travel here in the Mara are considerably more, just because we've got 160,000 hectares of, of traverse uh, that we, we cover, just the ground that we cover. And the roads, you know, there's certain roads that are more difficult than others. She is most definitely on a mission. What have you seen? Because I can't see anything. That's an elephant. You don't want to eat an elephant. Not a big one. Now, unfortunately, the, the area that we're in is the non-off-roading areas. So there's certain places where we can off-road and certain places that we can't. There's very good reasons for that decision um, in terms of the amount of people who come through and visit these parks. It, it wouldn't, there's certain places that are basically high use and more vulnerable to damage. What have you seen, my lair, my girl? A good vantage point. Oh, okay. Well, that was uneventful. A lovely view of the elephant and the lion. The second lioness on her way to join her. So they're definitely thinking about their meal for the night. And although they're not starving, they do look a little hungry. I saw some zebra up towards the escarpment. Cheryl, yes, there will be somebody permanently in the Mara for our safari live shows for the foreseeable future. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you possibly exactly what the schedule or the rotation is going to be, but there will be members of our camp here. Obviously, one of our goals and one of our objectives will be to find and employ such a, we've already done with Manu, um, Kenyan staff as well. So it might be that they, they the people who are up here but honestly I mean I can't give you an exact answer because I don't think we know just yet but yes there will always be somebody here in the Mara for Safari Live absolutely all right we're gonna do a switch now and uh, Craig is gonna go for, to infrared obviously the light is getting a little bit low there we go Paula a lone lion attacking an elephant highly highly unlikely the only situation where that might happen is with an elephant calf in a situation where perhaps the mother is exhausted from giving birth then a lone lion might attack but really elephants are far too big and far too strong and far too big of a risk for lions to try and hunt on their own and elephants know that and for the most part, even the, the lions that do specialize in hunting elephants and that do hunt elephants, they only do it when they absolutely have to. During dry season when other food is particularly scarce. And they'll generally go for young males that are on the outskirts of the herd. And the reason behind that is because the herd is less dedicated to protecting them. To try and go for an elephant calf with the rest of the herd around would be almost the lion equivalent of suicidal because the elephants will try and cha will chase them away will protect the calves so no it's highly unlikely proud cat mama yes they do they actually do in it they they play an enormously important role in the lives of their cubs so in, proud cat mama was wondering about whether or not male lions will protect their cubs not as hands-on as the females will if you could say that the females are always with their cubs they're the ones that will defend them from hyenas they will the ones that will fiercely protect them sometimes at the point of risking their own lives but the males play an important role as sort of absentee fathers because they when they visit the cubs they're very tolerant but they do a really important job of showing off other males so they keep the territory safe 
and essentially that stops a potential territorial takeover because when a territorial takeover happens the new males will kill the cubs and that they will not the females will not be able to stop them or protect the cubs if it if it comes down to that so they do in their own way and yes if they were happen to be at a kill and a, and a hyena was going to go for the little cubs uh, they would get up and chase them away that I think is partly instinct coming stemming from the desire to change hyena away, chase hyena away. All little cubs looking into the drainage line. We're going to leave the little ones and follow the adults. Let's go find out if shadows on the move again. She's not on the move. She's sitting on a mound as low as possible, and right below her, just on the other side, is a little dip. And there is a diker sitting just on the other side there. It's not far from where she is. So we all with our lights off and we're in infrared. Just watching her as she basically slowly but surely makes her way over the top. And hopefully this diker will move towards her. One of the diker already ran away. And so I think maybe, just maybe, she's just keeping low because just now she had her head up and now her head is down and she's staring into this ditch. So I think the diker is literally right below her at the moment. So we're just sitting tight and patiently and waiting and hoping that she is going to get moving. You can see the tail is twitching a little bit so she can spot something for sure because her head was up and she's gone as flat and as low as she can to reduce that profile. And the light is getting very dark now. It's not easy to see in... It's getting more and more in favor for her. But also, while we were following her and we were kind of moving around with her, there was massive amounts of alarm calls off to our eastern side. So I don't know if maybe the cub is somewhere in that general vicinity or some sort of thing that's going on because there's no way those kudus and impalas could have seen where she was, but they were barking and shouting. And so I think there might be another leopard not too far from where we are. I'm hoping anyway. Of course, I might be wrong, and they might have had x-ray vision from where they were and seen her, but I don't think so. Now, if you're wondering where we are, we're actually at the old hyena den off Zoe's Road. So there's an old hyena den. It's just behind me at the moment, and we just, I just quickly checked it out as well while we were there just to make sure, and no sign of any um, young ones on that side of the world. So there's definitely no hyenas that have been utilizing that den any time in the last little bit. Priya, who's 11 years old and a new viewer to Safari Live. Hello, Priya, and welcome to the biggest safari vehicle in the world. I hope that you're going to enjoy your time with us, and I hope that you will ask lots and lots and lots of questions as you watch the animals of Africa and you learn about them. Now, you are asking, what is the difference between a cheetah and a leopard, and how do I know that this is a leopard? Well, basically, the easiest way to start with, and just because we can see from the back like this, is if you look at its coat, you see that the spots on this leopard look as though the spots have exploded. So there's like a middle section and then exploded little spots on the outside. Now, if you had something like a cheetah, the spots would be round like that and solid black. There wouldn't be any light color in the middle of that spot. So it would be spot, would be solid and, and lots of little dots and almost looks like polka dots all over it. Then you would also find that the cheetah is much longer with a long tail that is flattened towards the end and the cheetah would stand a lot taller and would have a smaller head with black lines that come past its face where the leopard doesn't. The leopard has white underneath its eyes and is shorter and stockier and is built for power whereas the cheetah is built for speed. Now we're going to try and keep up with her and see where she's gone if she's gone into this drainage section. It seems to have just disappeared down below here so I just want to quickly shoot off to my right hand side where I can at least see down into that area. Rex is going to go around the other side so he can keep hold of her from there and hopefully between the two of us we'll be able to keep where she's gone. I don't see her though. Do you see her, Senzo? So I'm just trying to spot her from here but she seems as though she must have gone down into this general vicinity because I can't spot her at all. The guys are going to check around that side and I'm looking from here. Nothing that I can see. Senzo, let's go a little bit to the left here. 
It's not an easy place. I can't cross here. It's too steep for me to cross here. So I'll have to go to the left a little bit. I don't know if they've spotted her on that side. Maybe they have. Maybe she's already moving on the other side. I think she is already that side. So let's go around and get onto the other side. Yes, there I can see her. She's moving around on the other side there already. So let's go around. Careful there, Senzo. There's a tree behind us. So we don't want to take Senzo's head off. I ideally like to keep my cameraman with heads. It is more sort of advisable and definitely more useful to have a cameraman with a head on his shoulders. Right. Tanya, you're seven years old. It's so nice to have the younger generation watching this evening. And you want to know, Tanya, how old are the leopards? Well, Tanya, it depends on which leopard we're talking about. This leopard that we're watching at the moment is almost 11 years old. So it's getting older for a leopard because the leopards only live normally to about in the wild a female leopard anywhere between sort of 14 years and 18 years sometimes a little bit more sometimes a little bit less but that's normally how much they live for this leopard though she lives she's she's 11 years old and and hopefully will live a long life still so there she is just sitting in the road and is slowly heading towards us so we're going to just stay with her over there she goes oh no she's crossing the road so we're going to have to go forward sorry Senzo. Nope, there she goes into the bush again. I was hoping she would come down the road, but she's obviously deciding that she wants to go this way. Now, if she heads north and starts heading up towards the DRC, Henia already made a comment saying that she should head to the DRC for dinner because, well, there'll be lots of meat in that area. So that would be quite nice. Now, there's going to be a car that's going to go past, unfortunately, and block our view. which is not ideal, so that's why my lights are all off. So Tula Ann, who's five years old, you want to know if a leopard likes to play in the daytime or the night time? Well, Tula Ann, generally leopards will like to move around more in the dark, so that's when they like to kind of move around more, is in the dark. Now, this vehicle keeps blocking me where I'm trying to look, so I'm just trying to find another way around into this area that I can see what's going on. There she is in front. So let me just try and get past here. There we go. So they prefer nighttime to land, and the reason why they like nighttime is because they have very good eyesight at night and that means that they can see like we do during the day so it's easy for them to see at night and on top of that it's much easier for them to hunt at night so they like to move around in the evening and they like to go to bed very very late sometimes they only go to bed in the next morning before the sun comes up so they are they are all nighters sometimes but they like it because it's easier for them to be able to find food and also to stay hidden and not be seen by all the other animals that we see out here that are wanting to spot leopards and try and stay away from leopards because remember a leopard is a predator so it's a meat eater and it eats lots of meat and it eats all the other animals out here like the impalas and the dikers and the steenbok so those animals like to avoid leopards as much as possible but at night it's very difficult to see them and that's why they like to move at night so there we go, she's just moving straight ahead of us now, which is nice. Just got to avoid all the elephant diggings that are around. And we're going Shadow's typical route now. We're about to hit Zoe's Road and heading towards the Balanites, the big Balanites that is famous because Brent fell out of it. So Brent's Balanites is where we're heading to. She's just stopped now, you can see, in this little thicket and is just watching around for a bit, which is quite nice to have a sort of moment of peace with Shadow because she's been up and down all over the show the last little bit and it's really been quite difficult to follow her and to try and keep up with her and as I say that off she goes again all 
Right, let's try and keep up with her one more time. We'll try and follow her through. It, it, it does get ridiculous at some point um, once we cross over Zoe's. If we cross that way, then unfortunately I'm probably going to have to leave her there because it does get really far too dense for me to even follow her. And we've put Rusty through such a lot this evening already that I don't really want to push it too much further. You can see, look at the wall of trees that are starting to appear. And so it does get really dense once we go over Zoe's Road and start heading westwards towards Impala Plains side. So I'll try and keep up with her as long as I can, but in the night it also gets a lot harder. Now, while I slowly try and follow Shadow through the thickets and along these pathways and into the night, I believe Taylor McCurdy is also following some pathways into the darkness of the Mara. Oh, so we haven't really found much out and about. We're just on a very windy road at the moment, with uh, not much in sight, unfortunately. Because we can't have all the luck all the time, and our lions were fat and fast asleep in the long grass. It was very difficult to even try and see them. So, as you guessed, we left them and search of try and find some others, but we haven't had much luck. Oh, what eyes are those down there? I don't know if I saw them correctly. Ah. Sorry, my earpiece keeps falling out on this bumpy road. Now, there's this massive valley down below camp. Basically, you can't see it, but down that direction where my spotlight's pointing. And I can't believe I have not heard leopard soaring coming from there. In fact, I have not heard the sound of a leopard for a very long time. It's quite interesting how they don't call here. I wonder why that is. I wonder if it's just because there's so many other predators around there to keep as quiet as possible. Perhaps it's because their territories are so large, there's no need for them to vocalize regularly, you know, constantly announcing for any other leopards in the area that could be passing through. Um, so yeah, quite interesting. So, so maybe they're just scent marking, although I haven't even smelt that signature popcorn scent, to be honest, while I've been up here. And I've seen, how many times have I seen it? For three times since I've been here. But also quite far away, so that might explain it. Just having a look, but again, hard to try and concentrate when you're shining spotlight. Uh -huh. Oh, lots of impala and zebra coming to settle up here. I'm just gonna turn my spotlight off so I don't disorientate them. I think they're on their way up towards camp. The zebra are very clever coming to live around camp. I reckon they must feel quite safe about there. I have yet to see any lions up on top of the ridge. There's nothing that's stopping the lions from growing up there. Maybe besides the fact that there's so many humans around. I'm just gonna use my spotlight now to shine on the road. Be safe, animals. Oh. I mean, well, not maybe, I'm actually almost certain that we'll see them tomorrow morning. We'll see them almost every single day. Cool, we're going to keep heading home. I'm going to send you back across to Tristan, who seems to have had a lot of luck with Shadow. Well, we're trying to keep up with her, but it's fast becoming an impossible task. So I'm trying my level best to stay with her through this well, I don't even know what to call it. Mess, that is, bush willows, terminalias, zebra woods, and monkey oranges. It's unpleasant to say the least. And so I think as soon as I can find a road, I'm gonna try and get to it. We've, we've crossed Zoe's already. I was trying to stay with her just for the last little bit of show, but I honestly think that it's getting to a point now where I'm gonna have to call it because well, as you can see, look at this. This is not fun at night and it's much harder at night to see stumps and to see holes and all kinds of things and I really don't want to damage Rusty at the moment. We we have our cars and we've got to keep them in good condition so she's now going to cross over back south towards Gauri Rapita and so I'm going to leave her here as she goes over the road because she's now heading basically back the way we came and I'm not going back through all of that 
with her again. So we're just going to get one last view of her as she disappears off into the thickets. And she's just straight behind there. And so she's slowly but surely heading in that direction and southwards, like I say, towards the Gauri repeater and past the Torchwood. But once she goes in there, I'm going to leave her be and let her carry on. I think we've followed her enough this afternoon. We've certainly been entertained. She's taken us on hunting the whole afternoon. We've been spoilt. She, I mean, she tried to dig up warthogs. She's chased diker. She's chased mongoose, scrub, uh, scrub hares. Parlors have shouted at her, so I think she's earned a break from us. And let's let her just slink off into the darkness. But what a treat it's been to follow her as long as we have today. So, I just want to see something. It's almost like she spotted something. And I just want to check. Oh, there is something that I can see just in the distance there. I don't know what it is. So, it looks like there might be something up ahead of her. Some prey item that she's busy stalking all of a sudden again. I'm trying to see underneath the bush and trying to get some sort of view of what it is, but I can't see nicely. It looks quite low to the ground, so maybe something like a dyke or a steenbok that she's heading towards. Can you still see her, Senzo? Yes, you can still see her, but see she's stopping and ghosting through the grass, kind of keeping quite low again. So there's definitely something in front of her that she's busy stalking. I'm not 100% sure what it is, but look, you see how she's slinking a little bit lower. And I'm not going to disturb her. If I go th crunching through here, I'm going to chase whatever that was. I can hear a red crested Quran calling as well. So I think what I'm going to do is rather just let Shadow go off on her own little mission into the darkness and I'm going to leave her there. And hopefully I'll come back here tomorrow and there will be some sort of sign of her with a kill. That would be the ideal situation. But whether or not that's going to happen, of course, well, we'll all be up to shadow. We've left her to do her thing. It's cloudy, it's overcast, so it's a dark, dark night. And that means the perfect conditions for a leopard to hunt in. And so I wish her the best. Unfortunately, though, I can't move around in any of that stuff. And all I'm doing is going to inhibit her ability to catch food if I do. Because at the end of the day, when we're moving around in places like this at night, I can't see very far at all. So I, can't, I don't have a situation where I can see like I could during the day and I can spot prey items from far in a field and stop and give her the space she needs. So all I'm going to do is just ruin her hunt. I'm going to just chase animals left, right and center because I have to keep her in much closer proximity than I would during the day. And that's only just going to lead to her not being able to hunt. And I don't want to do that at all. So I'm going to rather just let her carry on and move through it. So Aiden, who's six years old, wants to know if the leopard take baths. Aiden, they bath themselves in that they will lick themselves. So they have a very interesting tongue. They've got a tongue that's got little hooks on it, much like a brush. And that with their saliva means that they can lick and they can get rid of all the dust and the dirt and the hair and everything else that is loose and keep their coats very, very clean and as though they've had a bath. But Cats actually don't really like water, so you won't find them going and swimming in water very often. And it's only if they have to get across a river to the other side for some reason, or if they've got to hunt something and they fall into the water, then they sometimes will, that will happen. But they don't like it, so they wouldn't want to bath, but they will clean themselves and it's like a bath for them. And they use their tongues to clean themselves and those little hooks grab all the dirt and dust and loose fur and make sure that they stay nice and clean. So it's a very clever system for a cat and they do it very well and that's why a lion and leopards and cheetah and will spend a lot of time grooming themselves and cleaning themselves and licking their coats to try and keep themselves as clean as possible. Right, so we're going to slowly meander our way home now. It's not too far. So Megan, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you there. You just broke up a little bit. I bumped my earpiece out. Ah, that's wonderful news. So Valerie, who is one of our moderators, apparently it is your birthday today. Happy birthday, Valerie. I hope you have a wonderful day and that you enjoy 
the day further. I'm not sure what time zone you're in and whether or not you've had a good day so far, but either way, either you must have a really great day or I hope you've had a great day and that you enjoy your birthday as much as possible. So that's good. And Kimi, you want me to say something in Afrikaans. Oh goodness, my Afrikaans is terrible. It is not very good at all, but we can say maybe um, feels geluk, lieve Mikey, um, omdat dit is jou verjaarsdag. There we go. So that is happy birthday, my friend. It is because it is your birthday today. So there we go. That is my bit of Afrikaans. Of course, it's not very good and there's probably some Afrikaans people that are watching that are probably laughing at this. And it's actually quite funny that I can speak, I can hear Afrikaans and I can understand Afrikaans very well. My dad is fluent and so was my grandfather. So I can understand it. People can speak to me in Afrikaans, no problem. But me speaking it is not very good at all. And it's all a bit of a laugh and I can hear Megan is absolutely cackling in my ear at the moment as she laughs at me, it's fine. I will get her onto screen at some point and doing it herself. But that's all we've got time for. So from Jamie, Taylor, myself, Senzo, Megan and Lou, it's been a pleasure. We'll see you on the Sunrise Safari tomorrow.